The three most important factors you should consider when hiring a trainer in order, you ready? You need to like them, it's extremely important. Number two, are they experienced? And then third, their education. Those factors you should consider the most important when you hire a trainer, especially if you just want good results. Yeah, you definitely got to like them. You, yes, you know Huge. what's funny? Yes, because uh, I know people are like, what do you mean? Why is that number yeah. one? If you those think are, those if are you're going to successful trainers, no, if you're not going to meet, if you want to meet with someone twice a week for three months, six months, a year, I mean, I had clients for, with me for nine, 10 years, you got to like them. Number one, that's why that's so important. Uh, because especially if you're not a fitness fanatic, right? If you don't love working out, then at least you should like the person you're, who's going to train you when you show up, show up for your session. Then the second one's experience and a very experienced trainer somebody who's trained a lot of people like you, okay? So if you're, let's say, middle-aged woman or you're a 20-something-year-old guy or whatever, it, a person who has a lot of experience training a lot of people like you will outperform the most educated, inexperienced trainer uh, 10 out of 10 times. And then, of course, education is important as well. You want somebody that has put some time and energy into learning biomechanics, uh, technique, function, uh, exercise physiology. That's also very important, but it's in that order. And I think a lot of people flip that order. It's not just in that order. There's massive gaps between each one of those two. Like that first one is so important that many times you cannot have a lot of experience, and not a lot of education, actually outperform yeah, the trainers. You can get away with being a good trainer. As, it's a fact. Without, yeah. well, and I tell you what, no, you know, I mean, the trainers. Boy, like, a lot of people are going to be mad. Oh, oh yeah. 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 People yeah. Every time I that. talk about this stuff, I piss off the trainer who just got out of college and finished his four national certs, and he's just getting ready to get started in the gym, or maybe he's been working in the gym for six months to a year and just doesn't like to hear that. But it's a fact. I mean, there was. There was a time, um, I remember early in my career, where I had no national certifications. I had no experience, but I was a top trainer. And it wasn't because I was good. It wasn't because I was educated. It's because I was liked by my clients. My clients liked seeing me. They liked they to liked, show up. They, they liked, liked to work with you. And what I, what I quickly learned was I didn't have to have all the answers. I was surrounded by other experienced, yep. brilliant trainers. I had resources like certifications and books and stuff that I could go to. The internet existed then. I could go do the I could go find the answers for my clients. I gave my clients that confidence that they could trust that I would give them the right answers. I may not have it right away off the top of my head, but I would definitely make them feel confident that I would get to the bottom of whatever questions they you had. You cared, you had passion, you had their best interest in mind. Those were like the three most foundational attributes that they're yes. looking for and, when they're hiring you. So. And that will carry you so far. Yes. And then, of course, Next after that is you have a lot of clients that like you, you get a lot of practice, you start to see a lot of similar goals, a lot of similar challenges. This now gives you the ability, okay, to be able to communicate things and forecast what would be coming down the pipe for those clients. Very, very valuable. Yes. Even more valuable than the third level, which is yeah. the education and the fact that, okay, now you have the tools to do what the, the, uh, the other two, right? You're likable. Uh, you can forecast because you've been doing this for a long time, and now you can even break the science down. Mm -hmm. Now, when they challenge you or they ask deeper questions, you don't have to do what I had to do, which was, you know what, let me go back and read and figure that out, and I'll come back and tell you, you could just regurgitate all that great science. Well, that's all part of uh, having their best interests in mind and caring, right, is you want to elevate your skill, and you want to be able to provide them with results. And, and so if you're working actively towards that, you're just inevitably going to get more educated, more experienced. Like you're going to go down that path uh, regardless. And so, yeah, it's, it's just kind of funny to me. That's, that's an ego thing, you know, for a lot of trainers that have went the opposite direction and went all education first. And like, that was their entire focus of like, well, you got to respect the fact that I have, you know, all of this knowledge uh, when in fact what they really want, what the client really wants is the opposite. But of course uh, the education. I mean, ability. yeah, look, they can like you, look, here's the, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if nobody wants to work with you, you can't help anybody. You can't anywhere. apply it. It's worthless. You, yes. It's, and, and nobody wants to listen to you. Nobody wants to show up. First of all, they don't like to work out anyway. Most people yeah. who love working out work in the fitness industry. Uh, most people aren't don't love working out. And the people that do don't necessarily need to hire a trainer. They just love doing it. The people that hire a trainer, they need that help. They need to figure out the consistency. They need to figure out the problems. But more, more importantly, they need to develop a relationship with exercise where it's something that they want to end up doing for the rest of their life. Now, part of that is doing it right. That's it's very important. I don't want to say it's not important. Doing it right is very important. But the other part of it that's important is 
this person shows up and they have an experience consistently with this trainer where it's like, this is great. I like doing this. I like working with this person. Yeah. This is a great experience versus this is a, a terrible experience. I got to show up. I got to drudge through this. You know, when I hired trainers, I made a very common mistake that a lot of managers make in the fitness space. I, when I first became a manager of trainers, I hired, I looked at resumes and I looked at their education. I said, oh, this, these are going to be great trainers. Look at this guy's got a master's. This person has a bachelor's. This person has all these certifications. Mm -hmm. And I actually hired very educated, inexperienced, whatever trainers. And they failed. Yeah. The ones that did well were like the brand new people that came in yeah. who had great attitudes. Just hungry. Very yeah. likable. Very, you know, they want to learn, but they're just, just this great attitude. And they just did exceptionally well. They got all the clients. They got clients great results because the clients showed up and they learned together and worked through the whole the whole process together. But now a, a lot of that I think is that I think when um when you're a trainer that goes and, and you and you go through the traditional route of schooling and then you get the national certs. I think you think that this is what's going to make you this like super qualified trainer and that you're going to be problem solving these like deep science questions. That never happens. <laughs> <laughs> I think, right? Yeah. And then you get into the real world and you realize that one, you rarely do get a trans, although you get some, you, you're an yeah, example. You, it of this happens. Help. You get some doctors, you get yeah. some surgeons, yeah. uh, you get some engineers that want to know a lot of detail. Well, they, at the very least, they want to know that you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you get, they're, you, they're you, get a, you get a few of those um, that, are, that are like that. But for the most part, most of these people really don't give a shit about your profession, really don't give a shit that much. They just care that you know more than they know and that you're going to guide them and lead them in the right direction. And they struggle with things like behavioral change. That's the struggle. And 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 their relationship with exercise food. And that has nothing to do with kinesiology. That has nothing to do with the, like you what you learn about human physiology. Like behavioral psychology is a whole different monster that, by the way, none of those, you don't get those courses on your way to your kinesiology no. degree. You don't get those courses in any national certifications. You either learn that in the school of hard knocks or you go out and you pursue that education because that ends up playing a much bigger role than you having to break the science down to anybody like that. And again, for the new trainers that are getting, they're like, why I was successful as a young kid when I wasn't that educated was because I was okay and comfortable saying like, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, dude, my buddy Sal, he's a total science nerd. I'll ask him. Like, <laughs> he he knows everything with that. Oh, and yeah. I'll, I'll talk to him tonight. And I think, and I, people just appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Better that than pretending like you do know or fumbling around and getting nervous because you don't. It's like, own it. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question, actually, now yeah. that you say it. Like I, I haven't had anybody who's asked that question, or I haven't been, yeah. I haven't seen I'll that challenge. Out. Out. I'll find out from you, and and when you do it with that, uh, when you're comfortable, you're okay with it. You say it with that confidence. That's all they're looking for. They're just looking for for somebody who's like, okay, good. He's gonna go solve that for me, so I don't got to think about you, you gotta it. You got to look. This is what a, 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 this is what you, if you're a, a person thinking about hiring a trainer, this is what you want to consider. You want to you meet the person. They do an assessment. They better do an assessment. Um, they take you through a few exercises. They talk about what it looks like to work with them. And then when you leave, you got to think to yourself, is this someone I'd want to meet with and spend an hour with twice a week for a while? I mean, you're going to spend more one-on-one -on -one time with this person than most people in your life, except for maybe your close family. And it's uninterrupted and it's vulnerable. You're working out, you're sweating, it's challenging. you may be doing things that are hard. Is this a person you want to be around while you're doing that? And if the answer is, oh, I don't know, you might want to find someone else. If the answer is, I could totally see myself doing that with that individual. I trust that person. This is someone I want to come meet twice a week. Then then that is a big yes. Yeah. Of course, experience is important because experience. there's things that you can you learn through experience that you don't learn through courses. It's, it's really almost impossible to learn through a course unless you're being mentored by other trainers and coaches. I think that's valuable. I think you know having some kind of mentorship following a trainer or a coach, watching how they interact. One of the best ways to do it. I mean, in our course, in our trainer course, we put a lot of that in the course. We don't want to teach trainers and course, uh, you know, trainers and coaches the hardcore physiology or that stuff. We, we wanted to teach them the stuff that we taught trainers, which is Yo, how you work with people. Yes, how you work with people, how you talk to people, how you help people stay consistent. Um, when they come up with these challenges, here's how you work around them. And it's all mostly behavior-based uh, type of stuff. Um, but that's it. That's the truth. And I'm, I'm we're, by the way, we're talking from the perspective of we trained trainers for years and years and years 
So I'm telling you right now, the people that I saw that were successful had those three traits in that order, mm -hmm. one, two, and three. The people that had those traits, the odds of them succeeding, and the success I'm saying, I'm defining is they built a good business, people came back, people got good results, people developed good uh, consistent behaviors that lasted beyond the training. It was those three factors right there. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now if you want it. Click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Yeah, you know, the last couple of days we've we've taken a few phone phone calls, live callers or whatever that, and some of them have been trainers. And I found myself re repeating kind of the same thing. And the second point that you made, the experience, probably the most important part of that too, is it, because it's not finished there. It's like, okay, that's great. You have a lot of experience. You've seen a lot of different clients. You've seen a lot of clients with the same, same goals, same challenges. That's the first step is getting the experience. The next step to that step is the ability to then forecast that for your client. And what that means is that I have this client that I'm I'm familiar with this challenge. I've seen this before. This client has a bad relationship with food. They've yo-yo dieted their whole life. They're they're married to the scale. Like I've seen this before. And I also know what happens in in month one, month two, yeah. month three, and what kind of challenge they have. So I know this. Now I have to also know how to communicate that and do it early on, right? And so, and this is very powerful. You knowing that that person is going to have a challenge with what they see, the number on the scale. You know that when their clothes start fitting a certain way in a month of working with you and they don't feel like they've lost weight, they're going to be challenged with that. Mm -hmm. You know when you reverse diet them and you actually focus on building strength and building metabolism, they're going to freak out when they see the scale. So a really good coach and trainer not only knows that because they've seen it before, but then knows also knows how to communicate that to that client. Here's what's happening in the yes. future. Yes. Here's yeah. what's going to happen. We're going to do these things, and I'm war I'm telling you, you're, we're going to have a hard time with this. And then you're going to want to do yeah. this. And then you're going to you're going to lose faith even in me because you're going to think, oh my God, he's taking me the wrong direction. But I'm telling you, this is what we want to do, and this is part of the process. You be a trainer that can do that. That is so powerful, so valuable uh, for the average person. Yeah, that's the application. Journey. It's it weighs so much heavier and experience and this is what's the the difficulty for the online space of being an online trainer it's like this is why we're you know i was very hesitant to give people advice in that that realm without actually physically doing that because how can you forecast if you haven't actually worked with somebody to create those predictables yeah, yeah. uh and yes you can listen to us and we can kind of you know lay that down that's why we have a course to do that right is is to try and give you that information just like you're going through and applying it yourself. But at the same time, obviously, that's nothing's going to beat that. That's going to tell you so much. You know, I want to add one more thing to this because we have we have several forums. Uh, we have a private forum. We have one uh, for coaches and trainers, another one that's just an open one for coaches and trainers. And every once in a while, we'll see a trainer will make a comment about something. And I can almost always predict what kind of ex or, or, or tell, I should say, what kind of experience that trainer has by the way that they pose their question. And uh, the reason why I'm saying this is the kind of experience the trainer has matters as well. If somebody has 10 years of training experience, that's great. But if it's 10 years of training experience of athletes and you're 38 year old mom or dad, and you want to work out a couple days a week because you just want to get fit, that experience isn't going to apply to you because they're going to train you based off the experience they have with athletes. And now athletes are a completely different animal. An athlete is work harder, try harder, do what I tell you and just follow it. Okay. For the average person, that's terrible. It's terrible advice. That advice almost never works. Um, same thing with bodybuilding coaches or other types of You trainers. can just write them up. This is the chalkboard sort of uh, yes. programming where you can write it up. You do that. You follow it and like you leave them alone. Yeah. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about. No, no. I mean, we had a trainer comment in there about how we tend to take cardio away from people when they call in. And my comment was, well, first off, I can tell right away by the way they asked the question was, oh, I know you work with athletes because you're talking like a trainer that only works with athletes. Because this argument was, uh, why would you take away their cardio? Cardio is good for the health, uh, the heart health. Don't you want them to have good cardiovascular fitness? And it's like, yes, but context matters. Oftentimes when people call in, they're challenged because they're plateaued. And oftentimes the reason why they're plateauing is they're overstressed, not getting good sleep, 
they're working out too hard for their body. Might not look like it for you because you work with athletes, but this is the average person. And when we look at their routine and we prioritize their workouts, unless their goal is endurance, which typically it isn't, typically their goal is fat loss with some health and some fitness. If I look at their exercise routine and I need to take away some exercise because I'm like this, your body's overwhelmed with stress. Taking away cardio is the first thing I'm going to do. I'm not going to take away the strength training. I'm going to take away the cardio. Then the next thing I'll do is scale down the strength training. The last thing I'm going to do is take away the strength training. And I'll use typically use walking. But I could tell based on the way that this person asked the question, their experience was, oh, you just it like- wasn't I, even a question. It was a dumb comment. Yeah, just, but just like when I, you know, I've seen trainers who work with bodybuilders, physique competitors, and bikini competitors. And you can tell when they communicate. It's yeah, like, but there's, there's there, your macros. Just count your macros. Hit your. T it's like that doesn't work for the. It was a person. dumb comment. It's yeah. it's it's different than a, there's a there's a way to pose that question and create an intelligent conversation between a bunch of professionals. And then there's a way to say a dumb comment. Like there's yeah. a dumb comment is what it was. It was mm -hmm. like I saw what post you're talking about, <laughs> which is why I responded right back. Is how long have you been training people? And then his response was. I train athletes. And so it's like, okay, well, th that I don't need, after that, I needed to say anything. It's like, you obviously have a one perspective that you, the lens that you look yes. through yes. that these, at, these people, why? And Dude. it's like, first of all, we've never, Apples and oranges. we've never had somebody get on live. If you've been listening to the show for long enough, no one has ever came on who's on a overall health journey that's in a good place physically and is doing 20 minutes of walking every day. And we go cut out your walking. <laughs> it's never that. It's the person who's crushed on calories. They're they're pushing cardio an hour or more three times a week, and they're stuck in a place they they're can't trying see to burn calories to yes. burn fat. And, and over, that's what that's why we're trying to tell like, them. There's another way to do it. No, there's no nobody in here thinks that cardio is uh, is unhealthy. It's just in the context of somebody who is trying to lose 20, 30, 50 pounds. And, and they those stress buckets already. Yes. Yeah. And they have, and they have reduced calories, yo-yo dieted forever. And they're at that level of where they're just overdoing things. Yes. And also keep this in mind with context is again, unlike athletes. Okay. People have a really hard time to committing to three days a week of 50 minutes of activity Listen, if, of any activity. hundred percent. If we could get the average person to exercise consistently twice a week, we won. Yes. We've won. That's not what people do. But if we can do this, if we could do this and we can make it strength training because it's the biggest bang for your buck across the board, longevity, health, muscle, fat loss, all that stuff, then we've won. But it's hard. It's hard to get people to do that on a consistent forever basis. I mean, this, I mean, it's irritating too on my end of the, the side of the fence because, you know, in performance, if I was to go back and really do a good job coaching athletes, fatigue would be one of the last things that I trained. Yeah. Okay. Because like the skill itself, you're going to acquire such a higher level of skill if you remove fatigue when you're actually practicing training and it. devoted to practicing that. Uh, and so if if this is something where you're just throwing them on a cardio and you're trying to get their heart rate at a specific amount, trying to burn calories and thinking this is all great, well, you know, you got to reassess that. Are you even applying the best formula for your athletes? That's why these new coaches and trainers that are out there, like, uh, like uh, what's his name, Kula? Brian like, Kula, yeah. Like totally different, totally different Completely approach. different formula. And Very I think successful. It's, it's, it's revolutionary, and I think you should really take a look at it because – I think that uh, it's been grossly overestimated in terms of the value. Yeah, this is why when I hear that, when I saw those, uh, who was it, that MMA fighter that hired, what's his name? Oh, yeah, that, uh, uh, that hired- uh, David, uh, Goggins. Yeah, yeah. Hired Goggins. I'm like, oh, God, he's just going to beat the shit out of you. Is that what you, <laughs> you don't need to hire anybody for that. You do that yourself. No, just to give an example, like uh, when I was, I remember at one point in my training career, I started to get more uh, advanced age uh, clients, people over the age of like 60, 65, and then 70 and above. And this was because there was a period where I started to train a lot of doctors. Then the doctors started referring their clients to me and many of their patients were people who were in this age group. And that was a learning curve for me, okay? Because my experience up until then was middle-aged individuals, you know, between 30 to, you know, 45, like, like, you know, everyday person. There's a big difference when you're training the everyday middle-aged individual and somebody who's 65, oh, 68, yeah. 70, 75, totally. deconditioned. And I'll never forget, you know, I, got, I had my first 70-something-year-old client. I, I thought I barely did anything. And I get a call the next day from one of their kids. She can barely get out of bed. And I remember being like, we did, you know, five sets of body weight squats and this and that. Like, it was a, total, it was a complete 
learning curve. But then I watched a really, really good physical therapist work with one of these individuals. And I remember one of the exercises she had him do, she had him sitting on a bench and she took a balloon, no joke. And she just popped the balloon to him. And all he had to do was reach for it and reach for it. And I'm like, that is an exercise for him. Yeah. That's where he's at. Yeah. yeah. And I had that learn. I had to build that experience as well because my experience was based on a completely different totally. demographic. And then I realized, oh, when you work with that, that age group, deconditioned age group, very little. You have to be yeah. very cautious. Totally and then they'll progress. formula you need to apply. And totally. do you remember when that was, You do you remember when you had that epiphany or when you were observing that? Like, did you enter that situation and like, challenge them and, and think they were stupid and like they didn't know or were you more open-minded to like trying to learn because you where, where were you at at that time so when i first saw some of the exercises that they were doing at first i thought that's just that's just too easy like you got to do a little more than that but yeah. then i had the experience of training somebody and doing what i thought was very little and then getting you know getting the report that they could barely move and i said you know what um i think i'm wrong i think i'm really wrong i got to scale it way the hell back because these these people, uh, not only do they not exercise, they don't move. So they're being brought to me by one of their kids or whatever. Many of them were not uh, independent. And most of the day, actually all day, what do they do? They sit all day long. So having them sit down and stand up three times was their set. That Okay, you're done with that. We're done with that. Let's try a different exercise. No resistance. Well, here's what I want you to do. Stretch your arms up as high as you can. And then they come to the next day and be like, yeah, I got a little sore just from doing that. Now, but the, the cool thing was they progressed. They all progressed. Everybody got stronger, which blew me away. The strength gains I saw in the elderly always blew me away. Your body really never loses its ability to adapt. The, yeah. the potential, of course, changes, but that always blew me it's away. It's always but, cool to see. But yeah, there was a second there where I was just like, really? I got to do that little? That little? And yeah, that was it. Yeah, did you challenge the trainers? or, or no, no, because uh, by that point, she had earned my, so much of my respect that I, because she'd already... I'd already been proven wrong on a couple things because she was so good at what she did. She was a physical therapist by trade. Yeah, yeah. So she really knew what she was doing. Yeah, I mean, you strike me as someone who would be like open. I mean, I've always, that's how I go into stuff like this. Yeah. Like if you got somebody who has been a professional for a, a long time um, and they do something different than how I think, like I'm so curious. Like, yeah, totally. Right away, I like I, I don't have the attitude of, oh, I know it all or I'm right. I'm going like, oh, that's interesting. Why do they approach that yeah. different than me? And I'm more open-minded to think like that. So I think that's what my knee-jerk reaction to to trainers that say dumb stuff like that in the forum is just like, how like ignorant of you to like make a comment like like that, like thinking that your little tiny bit of experience with just athletes, you know better than arguing with three guys that have been doing this for what combined 65, 70 yeah. years of experience of all different types of people. It's like, like what, why would you not stop in your tracks? Like, wait, wait a second. Maybe I'm the one who does yeah. it. Maybe well, it's, that's, you know, yeah. versus like, yeah. I think the way the comment was like, they're not knowing their bias and this, like, and I'm just like, <laughs> bro, really? Seriously right now? Like, yeah. this is so funny to me. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of like when I meet these guys in the competitive world, <laughs> that were competitors and because they got so jacked, right? Because mm -hmm. they went from fat to fit to shredded, you know, and they, they became pro men's physique athletes. Now I can train people. Yeah, now yeah. they think they, they have like all the tools to train average people and it's like, Dude, and then they were applying it the same way that they they, they applied to them getting in oh, shape. It's that's like the worst. Like, dude. oh my, you couldn't be so far off, dude. Like, I would see, I would mm -hmm. see these, I would see these girls uh, that would come in, um, and they do the work with me or one of the other trainers. But they'd come in and they you'd be so destroyed, so depleted, so hormones out of whack. They just finished a whatever show, and they'd be eating like eight hundred calories Ugh, yeah. a day. Now, by the way, not. 800 calories and doing nothing 800 calories and doing an hour cardio and an hour strength training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, and I remember I'm like, Oh my God, like you're this, it's incredible that you're here right now, yeah. which number one, it proves the, the power of the, the body's ability to adapt, especially when you're young. But I can't believe somebody just, like, why did you do this? Oh, I kept plateauing. So they just kept cutting your calories. Okay. You know this, I mean, and, and not to continue to, and I don't want to keep picking on the, the dumb kid, but I'd like to, I think it's a good point to educate. No, really though. I think it's a really good point to educate the audience and other coaches and trainers to understand this. Like, cause it took me a while to, to completely wrap my brain around this too. Cause I do understand where he's coming from. Definitely would have approached it differently, but I understand where his logic is or what he, how he sees things. But when you start to realize that the, you know how to, and back to your original point, that I think is so important is 
if people strength trained full body two days a week, we would not have an obesity epidemic. Yeah, yeah. Like we would literally not be in this situation. That's the biggest problem. But part of why we are is because it is so difficult for people to commit to that much activity. So when you start to really start to grasp that, that that is That's the majority, that is the majority yeah. of people. Yeah. And they're, the anomaly are the people that can go exercise five days a week consistently for years. The people that just love it. Yeah, that's yeah. a such a that's a fraction a of a fraction. Ask. Yeah. So when so once you first wrap your brain around that and you grasp what ninety percent of the people are more like, and that you go okay as a trainer and coach. I'm trying to create habits for this person that's going to make the greatest change, first of all, for them, but metabolically, physically, health-wise, and then also what they could probably do forever. What does that look like? Does it look like an hour of cardio three times a week? Do I think that's bad? No, I don't think an hour of cardio three times a week is bad at all. But if I had to choose that I may only get... 40 minutes to 50 minutes two times a week with these people. What's going to give them the most what's, bang for the buck? What is going to give them the most? And, and, and when I'm trying to build on a program and start them somewhere, where would I want to start them? Well, I'm going to start them at the lowest, barri lowest barrier of entry that's going to give them the greatest bang of buck. Now, granted, and this is why your point, context matters. That same person we may be giving that advice to right now, but let's fast forward a year, two years. They got their results. They lost 30 pounds. They're consistent. They're they consistent. Like yeah. Let's add some cardio. Yeah. Let's add some more activity. Let's do some more things and make you even healthier and more fit. That's great. But this is what experience tells you. Experience tells you most people end up quitting and overwhelming themselves with too much and their body stops responding, and then they get frustrated. They throw their hands up, and they don't do any more. Like that's what experience tells you when yeah. you've done this. And long to enough. the point where I, I used to be the guy that would convince brand new members to come to the gym more. Yeah, I eventually became the guy that convinced people. No, no, no. I know you say you want to come four days a week, but I only want you here two days a week. The second version of me became more successful with people when it came to results, and I learned that because people overcommit, their body stops responding, they don't like it, and they never come back. Oh yeah. my, just never come back. No. Anyway, I want to ask something because, uh, and maybe Justin, you know this better than anyone in here. I yep. saw a post by RFK mm. saying that he's going to stop something along the lines of chemtrails. Like, we need to oh, stop the dangerous practice. I saw you guys. So these are real? Uh, like, they're actually doing, like, spraying chemicals it's in no the air on purpose? It's no longer conspiracy theory? I mean, he said this is happening. I mean, yeah. essentially. This yeah. is a real thing. This was a post on uh, X. X. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I did see that. Yeah. I mean, I, I <laughs> yeah, I like how you uh, refer to me as the authority. Well, you're this. the, <laughs> I'm like, bro, I, you're winning. Chemtrails. Yeah. I know. Okay. All of them are happening. Like, yeah, like, bro. like show me something that <laughs> I said, oh, you know, maybe the ridiculous with like the lizard people. That's going to come out later. If that comes out. Yeah, I swear, that, Justin. I, yeah. Just, I'm not going to down. Just wait. Give me a, give me mm -hmm. like a size the spider caterpillar or whatever. That was your only right. real bad mix. We got to have some small losses in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. I apparently. Apparently, it's it's been happening, and, and you see it. I think in, in more areas of the country than others, and like yeah. some people have been reported in the sky. There's like crisscrossing patterns, and it's like being inundated with a lot of these. <laughs> and what are the uh, chemicals that they're finding in this? Do you know this? It's like I know barium, one has aluminum, uh, aluminum, yeah, uh, aluminum dioxide or something like that. What's yeah. the purpose? Is and, it to and so the cloud seeding was one part of it, okay. which was I know in uh, L.A. or some county down Southern California. Uh, they actually proved that it had like some kind of uh, I don't know what chemical that was in it, but it it seeds the um, it seeds the the clouds so it rains and then mm -hmm. it you know within a, a few days or so it was like a lot of rain all of a sudden and so this has been something they've been experimenting with, uh, but also too like. Uh, there's been like toxic chemicals uh, they found in, in a lot of these uh, residue clouds. So there was this guy that was, that was uh, recording flight patterns and he was showing the flight patterns of some of these planes over areas and a plane wouldn't do this. It wouldn't fly in a circle and then fly it's zigzaggy back and forth <laughs> over a, a, a huge area. Where's he going? Why is he, go why is he doing that? Yeah. So what's it doesn't the make any sense. What's the theory? The theory is that they want to cool down the they, they want to create some kind of a mist or something to cool down the ground or is it just cloud seeding or is it other nefarious shit like we're spraying chemicals in the air I'm to I'm sure do there's other people that are thinking more nefarious reasons uh, just because of uh you know any kind of toxic uh, 
chemical like in the environment is going to uh, suppress our immune system. I'm confused. Okay, there. How how does anyone get behind even doing this unless there's got to be some logical reason that they're presenting to the pilots, to the people that are organizing this? And it's not like a bunch of pilots blindly go up and go spray chemicals in the clouds because somebody told them. Like, the only reasonable to one, I, yeah, is the cloud seeding. Global warming is, is that what that's the, what is I that, was thinking. Is that, so that would be my my thought process is like we've we've convinced people that this is one of the ways that we fight global warming is by getting more more rain. I don't know. I'm gonna look up look Doug, let's look I up chemtrail. Or has somebody has somebody chemicals. done the math on like, hey, when we have these droughts, like when California had a drought, like how detrimental that is to our crops and how much that hurts agriculture. And so we've learned that, hey, we got to make sure we have at least this much rainfall to make sure that our agriculture doesn't go backwards. Like, there has to be so, a logical reason. It's not like they're going out there and just poisoning fucking people. Like, what is the what is the conspiracy to that? Like, so that's here's a comment because I I would I'm leaning more towards your latter statement <laughs> these days. Well, so Ken, so he rep he literally reposted this video, and underneath it he put, "We are going to stop this crime." And I'm like, what? <laughs> what know, crime? Like, what are you talking about? Uh, so the conspiracy theory is that these are pilots that are secretly spraying chemicals on unsuspecting populations. According to the video, the pilots are hardened to humanity, could care less about killing off unwanted or leeching aspects of America and the world. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, this was one I was always like skeptical because you, you, it, it, you know, whenever you have like these turbine engines, like it just naturally creates this this uh, jet stream behind it. Uh, it creates these clouds. Um, you know, contrails. Contrails, yeah. yeah. So mm. not chemtrails, contrails. But so what's the difference, right? Like it. One is it, uh, water vapor. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, like if you're gonna see it uh, in in the sky, like, do you know the difference by seeing if one has chemicals versus well, the other? Well, so, so my understanding is contrails, which are water vapor yeah. from jet engines. You know more about this. Than I know. You well, I was gonna say I defer to Doug. Doug, I'm not an expert. I'll, this, this I'll put that out there right now. How hard about. is it to go get up in a hot air balloon and go test it? Well, we could do that sometime, Adam. <laughs> but my understanding full. is is that water vapor from the <laughs> contrails, bro. You're sometimes you're brilliant. Yeah, I mean, smart. Let's set smart. some cups up on some balloons. And catch, catch <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. do it. Let's go, see. go ahead, Doug. That's oh yeah. So water vapor from contrails. If you watch a jet go by and they have that a contrail, it will evaporate very quickly. The chemtrails, oh, according okay. according that they stay up in the sky for mm, hours. Okay, I was reading on cloud seeding for uh, rain. It's uh, aluminum oxide. Yeah, mm. that sounds horrible. And silver iodide. That sounds horrible. Oh, yeah. aluminum. Yeah, aluminum the in the atmosphere is not really very good. It's yeah. been associated with uh, Alzheimer's. So maybe this whole time when we remember when we did our aluminum test, we all had super high. We thought it was the lights in here. So maybe maybe we just get rained we're on. We're getting Kim trailed <laughs> like crazy. We don't even know it. <laughs> so you know, okay. So here's why some of this isn't crazy. This is why it sounds crazy because it's like you know, it's it does it's until not good for us. It does until okay. It all sounds crazy until you see the stuff that the government's actually admitted to doing. Like things in the past. Right. There's the Tuskegee syphilis experiments where they injected people with syphilis, Thank didn't you. let them know what they were doing, just to see what would happen. They did plutonium experiments also where they had people, they sprayed them with plutonium. Let's oh see my, what happens. Oh they did God. mustard gas experiments. Of course, Operation Midnight Climax. That's when they were giving yes. a bunch of prostitutes and their mm -hmm. schmoes or whatever. LSD, M MK Ultra. Yep. Yeah, there. I mean, there's a whole bunch of. In 1950, the arm, the the U.S. Army was involved in an experiment to test the possibility of biological warfare. They did so by releasing biological weapons into the streets of San Francisco to 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 test their effects. That was in 1950. I mean, these are all admitted things that they've done. Yeah. They've done measles vaccine experiments right. in children. So that's why it's not that far-fetched, as crazy as it sounds. Yeah, you know? I think, in fact, I believe there was one where there was a town where they did spray some random chemicals, and then they came in to see, let's see how everybody, uh -huh. let's see what happens here, dude. Dude, the, the GMO mosquitoes and uh, everything they released, and, and they, oh, you know, I'm that. still skeptical about that because, uh, you know, that sounds like a terrible idea. There's, I know what the idea what's is. The, what's the super spreader of disease? That was the, elsewhere. That yeah. was the Florida Mosquitoes. thing, wasn't that? Florida? They're already. I think they're releasing them in other places. I think uh, they're doing it. That was the one that where they, they eat the other mosquito or eat. No, what bugs, it is right? is they're they're modified so that when they make, so they can't. Yeah, they, then they become sterile and they can't yeah. reproduce. So it's like it it, it kills out the out population. Got it. Yeah, out competes the population. Yeah. 
That's the theory anyway. All right. All right. Um, anyway, here's another thing that sounds like a weird <laughs> Sal brought it up. I know I had to. Yeah. Um, here's another thing, but this is a study that just came out. This is a cool study, you guys. They uh they took people with uh heart disease and they had them all sing music or sing music on their own to test the effects on heart health. Okay. I know it sounds weird. This study was carried out by researchers at the Medical College of Wisconsin. They wanted to find out what effect singing might have on cardiovascular health of people. And so oh, they picked heard, three different songs. I've heard this. Did you? Okay. Yeah, I've heard this is the, um, there's like the way the crescendo is, it like does certain things. Well, so I don't know. So here's what they did. They I picked three this. songs. Mm -hmm. Hey Jude, mm -hmm. Jolene, mm -hmm. and Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. And everybody had to sing the songs for 10 minutes to see what happened. The researchers measure, measured vascular function before and after each singing period. Guess which one of those songs had the greatest positive Amazing effect? Grace. On Amazing health? Grace. Yeah. Amazing Grace. Easy. Of course. Yeah. By far. Yes. Amazing Grace is good for your heart to yeah. sing that. They compared the other songs to it, which is kind of cool. Very interesting. I mean, right? those are other two good songs. I mean, yeah, they're all great songs. And, and I mean, we, I and actually think that's a, like a lost thing in our culture, like, because it's interesting when you think about it. That carried us so far. Singing? Yes. I mean, most all of- That's how we told stories. It is. Yeah, kept reporting, That's, yeah, that, the, the original way yes. we learned anything and everything was through song. And so, I mean, what made me think about that was, and I've shared this on the podcast, I told you my- uh, my cousin who homeschools. Yeah, and I remember. Oh, she does that with a lot. Yeah, of yeah so yeah. there. So part of their home homeschool curriculum, they start them really, really early, like kindergarten, and they teach them like two lines. It's mm. very easy, right, for them at that age. And then, like through their whole, like they build on the song. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they get into like high school, it's like a ten minute song oh, yeah, that they can right. sing, and it's like an entire That's so rad. timeline of history. Yeah. And it's it's kind of cool to like listen to the kids like sing it all because they all know know it really mm -hmm. well, and because of it they like they remember very dates that I don't remember learning in school of wars and, and super, certain things that happen and certain it's wild like, and it's like of course you know but why don't why why have we lost that why well, is that not taught in every school if that was how yeah. we all learned our entire. It's a great question, and I mean, this this reminds me of having I've been having a lot of conversations lately with Everett about this kind of stuff, and he just like started a new school, and so it's all kind of you know top of mind for him. We got in this discussion about like you know what my philosophy was more like: tell me how to learn, don't tell me what to learn, mm -hmm. you know. And so yes. he's like, "What do you mean by that?" And so we kind of got into that, and. Uh, you know what he's reading right now, which is kind of interesting, because uh, I was kind of telling him a little bit about how Jim Quick kind of highlighted some of the stuff on our show and, and mm. was kind of talking about like how to remember things more vividly and how to use that as a skill and how to yeah. speed read and how to kind of do all this kind of stuff. And he's like, really? Like, you can learn this stuff? And I'm like, yeah. And so he just started reading his book, Limitless. He's oh, like, really? And so he's like in chapter three, and he, he comes back, he reports to me. Oh, that's great. Uh, it's, he reads it in between because he, he finishes his work before, you know, some of the other kids. And he, they're like, okay, you can do that, but you got to read a book. And so he's reading that book. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Which I think is pretty oh, awesome. Shout out to Jim. Yeah. Oh, so shout, out, out, shout out to Jim. Yeah. Jim. So that, that you just remind me, uh, he actually reminded me of a funny story, but also to your point with uh, that, that stuff. So Kumon is like that. So that's what my son is is uh, going through reading like that right now. A lot of memorization and just familiarizing the kids with the words. And it is, it's teaching them how to learn how to read right, right, right. versus learning. It's like so different than how I was taught. And right. It's fascinating to watch it unfold. And so... Uh, last night, um, uh, we had, Katrina and I had a moment. We were both working, and uh, at the same time, while he was home, and had this moment of like guilt, where he walked over and it was like, uh, "You guys are both working." And her and I both went, "Oh!" So we both like stopped, and like I, she put down what she was doing. I instantly engaged with him, and then it was like, you know, that's it. Like, I was like, we got to get better about that. Like, obviously, we all know that we're in a period of time in the business right now. There's a lot of stuff going yeah. on, and so a lot of more work is carrying home than usual. And so we kind of had that moment. And so then the rest of the night, I was like fully engaged with him. And when I'm fully engaged with him like that, not only are we playing, I'm also incorporating his Kumon stuff. And we're and I'm doing it with him and we're playing. And then we, we, it carries into the bathtub where I actually get in the bath with him. I haven't been in there in a while with him. And, and I'm doing it. And he's learning like I can say a letter. And then 
uh, I can challenge him to, to re- how many words start with that letter. So it'll be like F, you know, and like, oh, flower, friend, mm. like, and you see his brain working and like trying and like sounding it out in, in his head or out loud for that. And I'm like doing it with him. And he looks at me, he goes, uh, last one. And I go, okay, yeah. And so then I thought he meant for that letter. And then I'm like, okay, like T now. And he goes, daddy, are, are, are we going to be done? And I'm like, what? You're, are you not having fun? Daddy's having fun. Like, no, this is cutting into my playing time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, buddy, we don't have to learn anymore. <laughs> I was like, all right, all right, all right. That sucks. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> call me out. <laughs> I feel so bad. You know, and I, you know, Katrina and I. Sometimes he goes to school till late, and then he goes to Kumon afterwards. Yeah. And I'm like, the kid is like learning for like fucking twelve hours in a day, and then, <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, dude. I get fascinated with it, and yeah. so I'm into it, yeah. and I'm doing it with him. And then he just like, and he was such a sport He's about going it. along. Yeah. yeah He's going along and he's like trying to be a sport about it. And I'm like trying to encourage it. Daddy, can this be the last one? Uh, and I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah, <laughs> this is cutting into my playing Dude, time. you're talking about it's singing. So great. Uh, Jessica bought these like devices that you could record your voice into and it's got this big button on it. So the kids, when they're in bed, if they want to hear her voice, they'll hit it and then she'll sing to them. And she thought this was a good idea. Well, anyway, we have them in the house. Jessica left. I was with the little ones and my, my three-year-old, my, my two-year-old, is walking around the house and sees the button and she already misses her mom when she's gone. She hits the button. She hears her mom's voice. She picks it up. She's like, ah. she hits it again. Ah. I'm like, Terrible idea. <laughs> just, just, made her, just, just made her feel bad. I remember. I when, miss my mom. You know? I mean, you probably figured this out too. Cause we've all, I mean, all of us have probably experienced this. I remember when I thought it was a good idea that when I traveled for work, that I would, you know, zoom in or call Max on the phone because I want to see him or yeah. I want to be, and like that always, it was, it's better, at least I have experienced, it's better for dad to be gone at work, completely gone, and then dad comes home than if he gets to see me but doesn't get to play with me and spend his time with me because Katrina would be like, if he sees you, it's such a, it's yep, more of a headache. Yeah. If I, he knows daddy's working, daddy's busy, yeah. daddy will be home, then I can keep him busy, distracted, doing his thing. Yeah. It's not a big deal. But if he sees daddy, it was always a hard thing for him to make that connection of yeah. like, why can't I have him here? And so like, we had to, we had to learn to like, cause I used to w- want to even read to him even when I was out of town and like, she was just like, we got to stop doing this. This just makes my life miserable. <laughs> After, oh, oh, yeah. 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 It's all funny. Where games. is he? When is he coming home? Yeah. And then yeah. she gets that. And when's daddy coming? And then it's like, I don't want to go to bed. And it's like, oh yeah. Okay. We just got to pretend oh, like daddy's tough. coming home another that's day. You know? so. All right. So I'm going to take a, a turn here. I've been reading about, um, uh, a chemical called acetaldehyde. This is the one, the chemical that is a byproduct of alcohol. And all I did was look up acetaldehyde itself. Boy, that is some nasty stuff. I didn't know that it's also a carcinogen. Um, it causes uh, massive inflammation in the body. I'll pull it up for you. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's... it's it's Now, this is what... Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what the product, what Z-Biotic did, was they actually made something that pairs and destroys that okay, or absorbs so, it. How does it work? Yeah, What's so, the science? Yeah, so uh, acetaldehyde is a byproduct of the metabolism of alcohol. So when you consume alcohol, when it goes to your liver, your liver breaks it down. There's a couple um, enzymatic processes, and they involve a couple enzymes plus glutathione. Now, if you drink a lot of alcohol, it overwhelms your liver. You get a buildup of acetaldehyde, and then you feel like, Dog shit. You feel terrible. But some of the alcohol, some of it, uh, you get acetaldehyde in the gut as well before it even gets to the liver. And this can cause a problem for a lot of people because the liver does a pretty damn good job unless you're pounding a lot of alcohol. So the acetaldehyde released in the gut gets in the bloodstream. And so then this is when you drink just a couple drinks and you're like, I just kind of still feel off or three drinks. And you're like, oh, interesting. yeah, what's going on? And I bet certain people probably Correct. process it better than That's others. Right. That's right. Interesting. In fact, as, as I'm reading this, al- this, these, these articles, uh, there's a gen- wide generic variance on how some people how well some people do versus others. So interesting. Mm. That makes so much sense why someone like me, who's like like one or two drinks, like just doesn't sit well with me. I'm and like someone that. like Katrina. I have seven and feel yep. totally fine. I'm just like that. Katrina's so, my people. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, what Zebiotics is, is it's a probiotic, but the the bacteria were, in, were, were designed or engineered, I should say, they were genetically modified to produce this, this enzyme that breaks down acetaldehyde. So you drink it, then it sits in your gut. This bacteria sits in your gut. And just produces this enzyme. You drink the alcohol. If you create any acetaldehyde in your gut, it gets it. broken down. Uh, mm. It gets into into benign parts. So this is why when you take it and then you drink, you feel a lot better. Now, is that similar to the science? I don't know if I'm going too far here for you or not, but is that similar to the science that like antioxidants do with free radicals? Is that kind of the same concept? Uh, different, but uh, free radicals 
get neutralized uh, by antioxidants. So, but, but they're not. It's not an enzymatic process. Okay, so it's yeah. not. That's not the same thing that's happening. No, this neutral. is literally you. You the, the acetaldehyde will get into your bloodstream, and, and it's just not good for. It's not good to have any of this. But if there's the if there's particular enzymes that can break it down, um, then it doesn't that doesn't happen before it even gets. And there. these yes, and uh, so what these bacteria do in the zebiotic is literally, they've been engineered to produce this enzyme yeah. as they metabolize. So they're literally spitting out this enzyme continuously in your gut, and it stays in your gut for hours. So you drink this, and it lasts all night, and you'll break down this acetaldehyde. Build do, do to follow up with them business wise. I'm curious to how they've been doing. I mean, yeah, I'm curious. I know they had some other products like in the pipes, you know, because they obviously they're doing genetic modified bacteria, and there's all these like cool attributes. You oh my can god! Do with them. I yeah. mean, we're investors. We should have. I haven't. I can't remember the last time I seen a a, a quarterly update on that. That's something I gotta re reach out and do. Now, I, I I got another study for you guys. That's pretty cool. Um, here's the title of it. You ready? Uh. Exercise improves cognitive function. Okay, we know that. But only when you move by choice. Huh? Uh, <laughs> they actually... <laughs> what, what, what? They, uh, so here's the subtitle. You get chased. Voluntary exercise. <laughs> that's a choice also. <laughs> 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 oh, scared fitness. Yeah. You ever see that video? No, yeah. Scared yeah. fitness. That was, that was the chainsaw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, show up and we'll see yeah, the shit. Yeah. Um, here's a subtitle. Voluntary exercise improves cognitive performance while forced muscle movement via electrical stim does not so they tested people moving their squeezing their quads flexing their muscles on their own versus stim stim oh, is a stim. device that goes yes. on your quad and makes your muscle flex mm -hmm. the, the cognitive benefits don't happen unless you cognitively are telling your muscle yeah, you're not intrinsically move. involved so there's never going to be a machine that is just going to make you exercise that'll give you all the same benefits so along those lines though i would love for you to go down the rabbit hole of the science and in, in like because that is making its way back to the bodybuilding fitness community yeah. again i don't know if you've been paying attention it's actually not the e stim no. but it's actually the uh, and i don't it's know it's in combination with yes, exercise yes it's with exercise these guys and these oh. are like smart bodybuilder dudes that yeah. i know and they're just all like connected while they're doing squats while they're doing push ups yes. and it's like zapping them yes right? yeah i think i have the, seen that i think i'd like to see the data on that compared to traditional exercise cuz i think the reason why it's so why it's become i don't know somewhat popular is because it's hard. You know how it is. Yeah. If, if I invented a machine right now, and I had my bodybuilder friends just or fitness get a cattle prod, try I know, it. Like what the? No, it's hundred percent. Yeah. If I invented a machine that was really hard, and yeah. I said, "Hey, try this. You are good at bench press? Try this bench press." Like, oh my god! It's oh, one hundred percent. They're gonna talk about it because yeah. it's really hard. So I think that's what it is. And they want to put a video. I just uh -huh. did this and it sucked. Yeah, I don't. There's. I don't think there's anything. Supporting I mean, they're it's, they're definitely trying to attach science to it, though. They're trying to say that they're getting more benefits out of it. Otherwise, I want to see end result benefits. They're trying I don't to say see... more muscle recruitment, or they'll justify it because of like the stimulation is probably like like getting some kind of response. But it's like it's again, you're 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 not uh, involved in that, and so you're you're not the one that's like actually generating that. So you're not gonna be able to replicate that. I, I think there may be some. Benefit and some correctional exercise. Uh, so I thought know. that maybe like so that like was if you my, have difficulty connecting. That is definitely not how I'm seeing it's being used. I'm definitely seeing it's like jacked bodybuilding well, and rehab that, for sure would help. But, but I, I could definitely see a, a I could see an application for it where it made sense. Where so I mean, perfect example right now with my rehabbing what happened with my pec. Right, I'm completely out of alignment. If I had to help get myself back where the yeah. scapula is, if I had some sort of a stem thing firing while I'm doing it, I could see getting that assistance would help me yep. better connect rehab it quicker so I, I could i could i could see myself justifying that mm -hmm. for that but uh, primo shape version of me hooking myself no, up it's to a bunch literally, of it's entertaining to watch you, <laughs> you see them do it it's really hard yeah. oh my god it looks so tough then you try it like, wow that's so hard frankenstein dude yeah, yeah. No, it's and like, what always and happens has been around for decades i know, I know. And, and let me tell you something right now okay stim uh not only has been around for decades but the soviets they studied STEM and anything. They studied everything. They came to athletic performance extensively. And what they came up with was not STEM. What they came up with was periodization, strength training programming, uh, and you steroids. Know, manipulating, <laughs> yes. Of, lots of steroids. Anabolic steroids. Yeah. They studied herbs. Uh, you know, it's funny. The Soviets, uh, they... You can really credit uh, the Soviet Union for some of their studies on athletic performance and certain herbs like rhodiola they were big oh yeah yeah they yeah. were big on rhodiola in was, fact they was it studied, them and that was it the swim team 
Were they, was that the swim team that did that? What was it? What was the? I thought it was the Russian swim team did something crazy like that. No, it was some I, th- mushroom I think you're thinking of the East Germans. Oh, okay. oh, is that what it was? East German swim team. You never heard that story? Uh, remind me. They showed up. I don't remember what Olympics it was. It was the East East Germany, which you know they were under the Soviet Union, right? East German women's swim team showed up, and they were just everybody's like, "What is they going jacked on? through us? Huge, yes, huge!" And, and, they, they, and they claimed it was like mushrooms or something. Oh, like no, that. they said it. What did they, they say? No, that was China later on. Uh, they, 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 they said, I'm "Oh, guessing it's all wrong here. Sorry. It's all secret training." <laughs> but we, it turned yeah, that was out cordyceps. It, look Chinese. up East German. That what it, was, it was cordyceps. Yeah. Is that, that what? was? The, I knew it was the, one of the mushrooms. Dude. Yeah, that was yeah. A, a Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, in two thousand something. No, this was. I don't know. I want to look up the what when this was done because you got to look at this picture of these women. They were for sure on gear before anybody took steroids. Like, oh, it's rhodiola. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. These are just strong, strong East German women. <laughs> like the West German women don't look like this. What the hell's going on? Oh. But they were used. To, did you pull it up, Doug? Yeah, I'm looking for it right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. They look like. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yeah like if it. Justin put on a, a bathing suit. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing going on here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing to see. Here. She's got a bulge. Have to get a, yeah, yeah, I have to get a lot of duct tape. Happening. But yeah. rhodiola studies were pretty interesting. They studied rhodiola for uh, their military, their Olympic teams and military. They wanted a they wanted something that would give soldiers an advantage under extreme stress, cold, heat, exha- exhaustion. And rhodiola, I mean, there's no, there's no miracle thing out there, but rhodiola definitely delivers. If you look at the data on rhodiola and exercise exhaustion, stamina, cognitive performance, it's like this really, it's okay. Ashwagandha is one of my favorite adaptogens. Rhodiola is like its stimulant cousin. If they were related, ashwagandha, relaxing, rhodiola, stimulating. Like kissing cousin. I, I, <laughs> I, if you're really in tune with Gross. your workouts and your fatigue, how you feel, Oh, yeah. They scrolled down, bro. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and they just crushed everybody yeah. in that Olympics. If you're really in tune with your, your training routine and you know how you feel fatigue-wise and you do a workout uh, with rhodiola and without, yeah, you'll notice the difference. Yeah, you will. Uh, that was like one of the, I, it was, it's one of the few supplements that I could like tell. A, you a did the red juice, the Organifi red juice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they have I, a good, they have a good amount. That, I mean, so that's, I mean, that's one way to use it. I always talk about using it as, as coming down off of caffeine. I think mm-hmm. it's the, to me, for me, it's the gold standard of, okay, if I'm coming down from my 600 milligrams caffeine and trying to come wean all the way off the, I replace the, the caffeine drinks with the red juice. It's just, it makes the coming off of caffeine a million times better. I gotta try that. I think I'm due for that. Like just at least I I was using it mainly when I was jumping over to cardio and like doing like hit sessions and stuff like that. Like I would and use it to come it. off caffeine. You yeah. use it to come off caffeine and it tastes good. So it's a nice repl- so it's not like this awful thing I gotta drink, right? Because sometimes like the the different like mushroom drinks and things that are out there and you know. Ugh. But that tastes good. It, I mean, it, it helps because it's got some stimulating um, properties. So if you take rhodiola, it's not caffeine, so you're not going to get caffeine buzz. No. But you'll get a little bit of energy buzz. You'll feel it. Uh, so you'll feel like, oh, I took something. Um, and then it helps the body adapt to, to stress. It's a, it's a classic adaptogen. So it is a great replacement for caffeine when you're coming off caffeine because when you come off caffeine – it sucks, and mm-hmm. and the crash is terrible. You know, if you, if you drink caffeine daily, you're going to deal with at least a week of withdrawal. It's one of the worst withdrawals I've ever experienced. Um, it's harder than coming off other stuff that I've tried to come off. Uh, and so it takes the edge off enough to give you that period of time where you you know get those receptors cleaned out, whatever. Go back on the caffeine. The other option too. Here's a great way to come off caffeine, and I'll, I'll use Organifi's red juice as a way you could do this. You take your normal dose of caffeine, let's say it's 300 milligrams or 200 milligrams, cut it in half, add the red juice to it. Then you cut the caffeine in half again, maybe three, four days later, add a little bit more red juice and slowly taper it. In that yeah, direction. I was going to see if, uh, about replacing like the last cup like I would normally do, which is with red juice. But yeah, you could probably just combo. Where, where are you guys at with caffeine right now? I'm at peak. <laughs> What's your peak? Three energy drinks? Do we have to drinks? talk yeah, about this? 600? Yeah, why do you say like, it's such a big yeah, deal? I'm, 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 because it's, it's for me. Too. Yeah, for you, it's a lot. It's not that yeah. crazy. What about you? What about you, Justin? He's, yeah, he's no, like crazy. Yeah, I'm he's like, like Graham. Seven, probably. 700. 700. Yeah. Wow. 
I mean, yeah. I was at six, but yeah, probably at seven. If I go, if I go, if I go, if right I go 400, <laughs> if I go above day. 350, <laughs> 400, present your best. I start to crash. I can't do it. anything 400. That's, I start so to that's me out. 600, right? So yeah. I, I know I'm like, I'm getting no benefits from it. It literally keeps it's just me keeping normal. you alive, keeping right me normal. <laughs> and, but at least what happens, like at least now I've been here enough time that I'm smart enough to not go beyond. Cause I've actually pushed beyond. And I know that once I go over 600, it, I get not only zero effect, I get negative effects. Yeah. So, and I believe that this there's this number for everybody. You're, I, I believe yes. that everybody has a caffeine number, whether they're aware of it or not, and it's unique to each person. You just said what you're three fifty or so. Yeah, about three fifty. Mine is six hundred. If I right now I'm getting no benefits from it, it's keeping me normal. But if I go any higher than that, it'll give me negative benefits. I'll actually get tired. I if I had because yeah. I've already had that today. If I were to drink another one right now, you feel lethargic. Oh, I uh -huh. feel ooh, Dead. Yeah. same. Yes, it's, so yeah. that's where I know that it's like okay. It's I do the drug addict thing though, and I just switch versions of it. You know, like I'll go like, you know, <laughs> please do tell, do yeah. tell. So you, you start with like so like coffee so you for do me. Colonoscopies with uh, or yeah, yeah. Colon, no, I'm not colon, doing. I'm uh, not doing the Ben Greenfield method. <laughs> yeah, I right. haven't quite applied that one yet. But uh, no, so you just change the different like um delivery so like uh i'll go rockstar then i'll go over to you know nitros and then i'll, I'll like do different uh versions of caffeine like pills yeah. or whatever, and you just kind of like Mess well around. i'll do this for a while and it's like totally worthless i yeah. should just like scale it down well <laughs> if, if caffeine were i mean if it were illegal, we would be. This is drugs. It's like how. That's no. what I'm saying. It's <laughs> like it's like day. a drug it, uh, user. If, if right. it was found today, it would be illegal. It would be banned. Yeah, it would hundred percent. Yeah. You look at the hospital. You know how many hospital visits every year there are because of caffeine. Isn't that, isn't that kind of funny? What a society we are. Like we, we it's like, ingrained in society. We make we make yeah. we demonize certain things, and we oh my god, this is so crazy yeah. bad. But then there's something like that that we all just like totally. And hey, no big deal. Let your five year old kid come in and order their Starbucks hey. with you too. Oh. Like that. <laughs> Dude, like if you're a productive member of society. <laughs> I mean, it's have you guys ever heard of the uh, the image that's on the Starbucks? No. Oh, okay. Either one, none of my conspiracy guys. No. No. Don't uh, know. Oh, pull up the image of what is the what the Starbucks Starbucks what logo? Yeah, it's a Starbucks logo. Is supposed to isn't be, it like a mermaid or yeah, something? It, yeah, but it's a type of a mermaid. And what that symbol means, I think, in Greek or something like that, is like basically subdue you like basically entice you oh is it the sirens siren. yes the sirens oh, it's, oh, a siren. yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a siren oh, wow. so they can so they use their beauty to get you to lure you into the water so they could kill you yes yep. thanks starbucks yeah, so nice. that is what it is it's supposed to be and and uh and then instead it's of good for you yeah wow it's a seductive mermaid from greek mythology lures sailors to their deaths with her song wow yeah. you know when i was a kind of interesting they choose that as their logo you no know, you want to hear something Smart. funny yeah. right uh, I mean, you want to hear something funny? When I was 15, I saw an old painting of sirens uh, luring a sailor in, and the sirens were like topless. It's an old painting, and they're in the mm -hmm. water, and they're luring him in. I remember this is a 15 year old so boy. So you ripped now. it out of the book. Yeah, listen, 15 year old boy, right? And I'm looking at this, I'm <laughs> yes. like, I would die. Like, for sure, I would go. That <laughs> I would go. I would go. <laughs> I would go. You win. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but they're going to kill you. Cool. I'll be in the water. Oh, that's funny. Anyway. Oh, that's funny. All right. Cool. Shout out. Shout out to our boy, uh, Jim Quick. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I thought call. Since Justin, brought that, jo Justin brought that up. I think Jim, and I believe Jim's a, a avid listener. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure he listens. So hopefully he'll, he'll hear the hopefully shout he hears out. That. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's been cool. It'll be, be great when he gets through the whole book and then I'll report back. I, you know, and honestly, uh, I think what a great, uh, this is like that that's something that you bringing that up reminds me of like that'll be something i want to teach my son is like the skill of learning right because that applies to uh, totally. to all other uh, uh avenues right so i think that's a super great shout out so jim quick holler at him i, I think his instagram is jim quick is it just jim quick Can you yeah see? jim quick last name spelled uh K -W -I -C -K, I believe. C -K, yeah. no not ck just k just k w, k w, -K w i k Element T is an electrolyte powder that you put in your water, no artificial sweeteners, no sugar, and it can help prevent things like headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue, sleeplessness, and other common symptoms of electrolyte deficiency. Who has electrolyte deficiencies? Well, if you don't eat a lot of processed foods, if you work out a lot, if you're on a low-carb diet, you probably need more electrolytes. And let me tell you, you'll know if this is you. You'll try one packet of Element T and you'll feel a difference. Go check them out. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump. And on that link, you get a free sample pack with any drink mix purchase. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Amberly from Florida. Amberly, what's happening? Hello. Hello. How are you guys? We're doing all right. Great. How are you? Excited now that you're on. How can we <laughs> help you? 
Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask a question about proper protein and calorie intake uh, and a workout routine. Um, for someone who has a history of fatigue and weakness and almost zero knowledge of working out. And when I mean zero knowledge, I mean, you guys had mentioned box squats on a couple episodes. Again, I had to Google them. Um, so I'm 34 years old. So I'm of average build, um, 5'7", 148 pounds. Um, I have been a vegetarian for most of my life since I was 12 years old. Uh, during that time, I had almost zero energy. I had to prioritize things based off of how much energy I had. I had a hard time going to work, let alone just like working out and doing extracurricular activities. It wasn't until about two years ago that my wife told me that I should probably go to the doctor for it. Um, and they told me that my iron levels were the issue. So I started taking iron pills and I went from feeling like I had to tread water every day to like doing things normally. Um, and I was really excited about that and I wanted to get into shape. So in October, 2023, I decided to work out um, five days a week, but quickly realized that that routine quickly wore me out. Um, and then I found that doing strength training exercises were more manageable for me. So I continued to do that uh, for three months, but I saw little change. I got a bit stronger going from like five pound dumbbells to like eight pound dumbbells, but not much else. I decided to reduce my routine to working out twice a week and asked advice from anyone I met um, about different routines and what I could be doing wrong. Around May, I found a community coach who asked me how much protein and calories I was eating a day. And I told him I was eating about 30 grams of protein and about 700 calories. He told me to double my calories and to eat about 100 grams of protein. And around the same time, I had a friend tell me that I might be overtraining and to listen to your podcast um, and to do one of the programs that you offered. So I started doing the aesthetics program and started listening to your podcast and doing about finding that three days a week of the aesthetics program was a little difficult. So I noticed after, I also noticed that after I increased my calories and protein, I started gaining weight in my stomach and hip areas. So I just wanted to know uh, just general advice, like am I eating the right amount of protein? Am I doing the right workout for me? Um, anything would be appreciated. Awesome. Okay. There's a lot to unpack All here. Right. So first off, are you still a vegetarian? Yes. Okay. And are are you open to eating um, animal sources of protein or is that a no-no? And it's okay if it is. I, yeah, I would really prefer not to. No worries. Okay. Um, and your iron is now back to normal? Yes. Have you had your B vitamins tested? Um, I have not had B vitamins tested. Okay. I would get your B vitamins also tested. So that's so the common deficiencies and deficiencies in vegetarians uh, are, are tend to be pretty specific. Um, they tend to be either iron, B vitamins, choline is another one that I would look at. I would look at, would you be open to taking fish oil capsules or is that off, off the table as well? No? I could try. Okay. I would like, I would like to see you take, so here's some supplements that I think may have be of value to you. Uh, a good complex, um, you know, B vitamin supplement. Um, and, uh, and again, get it tested on top of it. it probably won't hurt to take it cause they're water soluble, but in, I've worked with a lot of vegans and vegetarians and iron B vitamins oftentimes makes a big difference. Choline is another one. And then, uh, uh, fish oil is another one. And then lastly, creatine, yeah. those supplements are valuable for most people, <clears throat> but nutrient deficiencies in vegans and vegetarians tend to be, like I said, B vitamins and, and iron. And if those are like you experienced with iron, because your iron was low, as soon as you took it, it was like, oh my God, I'm like, this is way different. If your B vitamins are low and you supplement, you'll notice the same thing, like another level up, like, oh my God, this is great. Creatine, everybody benefits from taking creatine for the most part. It's a healthy supplement. It's good for the brain. It's good for the organs, definitely good for muscle. You'll gain maybe a pound or two on the scale. Don't worry. It's hydration within the muscle. So it's not body fat. It's actually lean body mass. Um, your cognitive function will probably improve. And we see more benefits with vegans and vegetarians than we do with omnivores because the main source of dietary creatine is animal uh, sources. Otherwise, your body has to take amino acids and, and turn it into creatine itself. Um, and, and that just results in less creatine and creatine is, is, is needed to produce certain essential forms of energy. So that I think should make a big difference. And then the, and then fish oil, uh, certain fatty acids tend to be low in vegan vegetarian diets. And so supplementing with fish oil tends to make a big difference, um, in how someone feels. Now let's talk about where I think a couple big mistakes you made. You were overtraining, 
uh, before. So then you decided to get one of our programs and you chose one of the highest volume programs that we have. The worst one. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so if, like, if you're already overtraining, it, you're guaranteed to overtrain by doing MAPS aesthetic. I think that can, based off of what you're telling me, I think you're going to get phenomenal results doing a program like MAPS 15. I think MAPS 15, uh, it's it's a five-day-a-week program, but you're only doing two exercises a day. You're going to the gym. It'll take you about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see immediate strength gains from doing that. I don't think your I think your protein intake and your calories are fine. In fact, I still think they're low. But I, re I think one of the reasons why you saw fat gain was your metabolism is slow. And your metabolism is slow is probably because you've lost a lot of muscle mass and you've reduced your metabolic rate through years and years of being you know nutrient deficient and not being able to strength train. So I think the advice of going up to, uh, let's see, what's your target body weight? What would be a good body weight for you at your height? I think, 100, I think 120 to 130 grams of protein a day would be fine for someone like you. Um, so I would aim for that. Just aim for that. Don't worry about the calories, but try and hit those grams of protein and try and do it from whole natural food, although I know that can be hard. Um, as a vegetarian, what are your main protein sources when it comes to food? Yeah, they're um, fake, the fake meat, like beyond meat, impossible meat. Okay. And then protein bars. Okay. And you don't do dairy either, right? No. No. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Would you do a, 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 a vegan vegetarian protein shake? Yeah. Okay. Organifi makes a really good one. I like their protein shake and it's better than the fake meat. Okay. So try to get it from natural sources, but it's going to be kind of hard, as you know. Nuts, seeds, legumes, that kind of stuff. Add probably probably going to have to add two servings of of Organifi's protein. I like their blend. It's organic. There's no artificial sweeteners. Uh, it's a. I mean, I can't have dairy typically, so that's the one I use anyway. Um, hit those protein targets. Workout Maps 15. Take those supplements. Get your B vitamins tested. And I think what you'll see is probably within the first week or two strength gains. And, and you'll see nice, consistent strength gains for a while. For like three, four cool. months, you'll see yourself get stronger on a, on a pretty regular basis. I think you just took that one. I know. You just took that one. Yeah. Mass 15, you'll, you'll like Mass 15, though, because of the simplicity of it, especially if this is kind of a new thing that you're embarking on. Uh, so, you know, <clears throat> MAPS, uh, MAPS Aesthetic is very you know, very comprehensive, has lots of volume, lots of exercises. So this kind of dwindles it down to a few exercises you can focus on and get good at the skill of those exercises. And, you know, just the repeated consistency of it builds a lot of momentum. So you're going to see a lot of like energy gains from that and strength and over time. So it's definitely the perfect program for you. But yeah, I mean, pretty much everything else. Uh, I covered. mean, it is it is a actual dramatic reduction from what you were Big doing. Time. So the one thing that I would add is just resist the temptation to want to do more. So uh, you'll probably have a moment where you're like, "This is it," or "I could do more." Or, I feel good. You so should feel do, that way. You know, you and 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 don't because you feel good. Uh, don't go out and think, "Oh, I'll doing more is going to be better for me." Like that's a great prescription for you. Like getting you up okay. there, protein wise, following a program like that. Um, you, you don't need to be crushing it in the gym, just touching those weights and we need to build some muscle. And this is what's going to send the signal to do that. If you're consistently hitting that protein intake while also following a program like this, you're going to get stronger. You're going to build muscle. You're going to speed the metabolism up and you should be feeling better week over week. Uh, and just resist the temptation to try and do more because you think that is a you better You should, idea. you should feel like you can do more. You should feel lots of energy to want to work out more. That's a good feeling. That doesn't mean you're doing too little. Mm -hmm. So what Adam's saying, I can't stress that enough because I think a lot of people think the way they should feel after the workout is like, the, oh, I, got, I just survived that. I just beat that up. I'm, no, no, no. You should walk out of the gym and be like, whoa, I feel better than I did when I walked in. That's a good sign. Because remember, all you're doing with your workout is you're sending a signal for your body to do something during the recovery process. The workout itself isn't building muscle. It's not making you stronger. It's actually damage. It's actually a stress. So you should feel good, which means you're probably doing the appropriate um, level of stress. You know, one supplement I didn't say that I think might benefit you as well are essential amino acids just because of uh, the, the challenges with getting enough protein. Yeah. And you can literally buy essential amino acids. You can buy vegan forms of this. And you could take like three tablets with every meal. And that'll improve what's known as the protein score of your overall meal because these are the amino acids your body can't 
produced that you need from food, and they tend to be lower in in certain types of proteins, in particular uh, vegan uh, forms. So you would just take a few tablets with your meals. I've worked with some pretty hardcore vegans, and the supplements that I mentioned uh, were all, almost always game changers, like almost always. But I will say this to you too, is Amberly. Um, I I did in my whole twenty plus years of training clients. Um, I had you know, like I said, I worked with a lot of vegans. There were that I can think of right now two that eventually had to add um, some animal sources because even with the supplements and everything, they were working with a functional medicine practitioner. It just wasn't working. But that's a small percentage of the people I worked with. So I think you'll probably be okay. Okay, cool. And then follow up question. I'm eating that protein even when I'm not working out. Yep. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You want to hear your protein yeah. targets every day. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Well, that was all. <laughs> that's it. So you'll you'll be you'll be Thank seeing you. your strength gains go up pretty consistently. But get that get your nutrient levels tested. Make sure there's no yes. other nutrient deficiencies. Yeah. Amber, how tested. long have you been listening to the show for now? Um, since like May. Okay. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. We're awesome. awesome. I'd love some follow up. Let us know in like a couple months how you're doing. Okay, sure. Please. Yeah, thank you so much. All Thanks, right. Amberly. Thank you. I remember the one client in particular. It was so hard, man. We were working with this. We saw nutrient deficiencies. We tried to fill it with supplements. It's so hard. Her levels went up, but she still felt like dog it's shit. It's so hard for me to resist not asking why. Yeah. For people, I can guess, but I might be wrong, but people who stay vegan that long, it's typically moral reasons. It's yeah, not for think, health. I mean, it's th that's the only way I can see it. Yeah. And yeah, justify. Cause but that's why I I want to ask because I want to hear that. Yeah. Like, okay, you say that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not gonna try and yeah. That. Not Who am I to more. say that it's you know uh, your morals are different than mine? There's nothing wrong with that at all, and so I respect that. But it's normally not that, Sal. Well, that that's a long time. Twelve to thirty four. Right. The data, like people who do it for health, they fall off like any other diet. Yeah. People who stay to it, it's either religious or moral. It's just crazy how we stay to stuff like that and our body is telling us, sending all these signs to us how unhealthy Listen, it is had, for us. I had a client, I remember this, it was for moral reasons for her and we did everything we possibly could and you know what the conversation was? We sat down and I said, look, at the end of the day, the animal you have to take care of first before you can do anything good in the world is you yeah. and you're suffering right now. Yeah. So she agreed finally to add eggs to her diet that's and it was like she took a miracle like it, it was like night and day difference uh from from doing that within a couple weeks but it was a tough one man. just like the gateway food you yeah know? it's like the only one i had the similar experience and it was like literally just please at least consider you know the egg. and then it was a huge in terms of cognitive function and energy and everything else but, I'm, but it's I, just like that's just one yep. little small step and i was trying to do it through supplements it's like choline that's what you get in the egg yeah right? protein that's what right. you need i only so. had a small percentage of them that actually did it for moral reasons most of the people that i trained yeah. that were doing it thought it was, thought a it was health, healthier thought it like was convinced it. yeah that yes that's why it's better for, for them. And I, of course, that's my own bias, right? So if, you know, I trained 50 of those clients and, you know, 45 of them were, you know, thinking that it was a healthy, better diet yep. or yep. thinking it's helping the environment, like they, they were going in that direction. Maybe five of them were like morally. And then again, if, like if it's morally, I get it. I'm not, I'm not even going to try and challenge it. But when you think that it's a healthier, better diet, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not at all that, and the data, Here's yeah. a fact. A Scary. healthy vegan diet requires far more careful planning uh, yeah. than a healthy omnivore diet. And the nutrient deficiency rate in a healthy vegan diet is much higher. That's just a fact. It's an objective fact. Can you do it? You can, but it's uh, it's well, much more challenging. Look at the ingredients in the, the fake meat. Oh. It's, well, and that's the part that I'm so tough. challenged with. And then I know. You, it's very but, tough. And the, but then you eat something that is like like a hamburger. It's just weird to me. If you believe, you know, morale, if it's a moral thing and killing an animal is like killing a human, uh, then yeah, then you're willing to to make yourself feel like shit, I guess. Our next caller is Justin from Florida. What up, Justin? Yo! What's going on? Hey, how's it going? Good, it's, man. Uh, happened, great to be able to talk to you guys. Thank you. How can we help you? Uh, so earlier this year, I uh, was, me and my wife were trying to have a child. So we started the process of, uh, I, I was doing blood work, trying to figure out what was going on and found out my testosterone was uh, nearly 162. It was just really low and, uh, it, 
we started taking clomiphene to raise my testosterone. I also started going to the gym as the doctor said, you know, working out will help raise my testosterone. And I kind of got carried away with the gym, really enjoying the fact of having testosterone finally, even though it's, uh, it's only 500 averaging. Um, and I got so carried away with the gym that uh, my recent blood work actually shows my uh, testosterone and fertility back to square one. And I'm just curious on how I should approach this, if I should push the fitness aside for a little while and focus more on uh, health and fertility. No, you, 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 it sounds like you did this. You were low, you started lifting, it went the right direction. You probably were over training and it came back the other Dude, direction. Like lifting is actually going to support this. Are not, you staying, not stop. are you staying on enclomaphene the whole time? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I also see that you, you cut your calories. Yeah. You want to cut on a deficit. Yes. That was, that was a recent thing I tried trying to lose a little bit more weight, a little more fat. And, uh, that's when I saw the uh, test results come back uh, negative. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, overtraining was, with uh, low calories is a recipe for low testosterone right yep, there. Yep, 100%. Two big factors of that. Yeah, you, you should probably be lifting if you're going to go to the gym and do a full workout like two days a week. Yeah, MAPS anabolic two days a week is perfect. Get stronger and don't go on a deficit. Yep. If you want to get leaner, just eat it at like a little bit above maintenance and try and build a metabolism to get leaner. But I wouldn't go on a calorie deficit, especially if you're looking at fertility. So as for everything I've seen for maintenance calories, I am, I'm 24 and I'm 5'10". I work in construction, so I'm you know somewhat active throughout the day. And everything recommends around uh, 22 to 2,500. Um, and I'm just curious if you work out on top of that, if I should maybe uh, bump it a little more or... Uh, this An easier way to do this is... Or more accurate. Eat, eat when you're hungry, uh, eat whole foods. Hit your protein intake. Like I, I wouldn't, uh, one, those things are guesstimating and they could be right on for you. They could be way off. And so it doesn't really matter to me what the, what all the tool, even the tools that we have on the internet to support and help people. If you were my client and this is our goal is, uh, you'd like to be leaner and fitter. You want to be stronger. You want to increase your testosterone. I'm training you two days a week, full body. We're not crushing it in the gym. We're always leaving two sets or two reps short of failure. I want you to eat when you're hungry, make good food choices, meaning eat whole foods and hit your protein intake. And I'm not going to really sweat if that's 2,400 calories or 3,200 calories. I'm going to go off of how you yeah. feel and your appetite and your strength. And I'm not trying to cut. I'm not trying to bulk. I'm trying to feed you when you're hungry and make good food choices and hit your protein intake. That'll do the, That'll do what we need yeah. to do. Did you do. Did you test for any nutrient yeah. efficiencies, Justin? Uh, yes, I'm actually pretty good in everything. Okay, good. Then, uh, I, I, my, my vitamin D was a little low, but I do take supplements for that now. Okay. okay. Now, I'm so, now, they didn't put you on HCG too, huh? No, uh, I originally started with uh, uh, tamoxifene and anastrozole, but I had some negative. Of, my my like 1,200. Why were they giving I was feeling like I was, I was high. I felt amazing. Why did they go there? But uh, I had some negative side effects. Yeah, I don't even know why they went that. Well, way, so were... tamoxifen will was it will block the estrogen receptor yeah, and that can raise the testosterone. Though? Stop the conversion to estrogen. Maybe his estrogen was high, or maybe to continue to add more. Of that are you sign. going? Are you going through MP hormones? Are you doing somebody else? I'm sorry. Are you going through MP hormones? Or are you going through? Are you going through us? Or are you going through somebody else? I'm going through someone else. Yeah. Are you doing clomiphene? Hey, uh, are you doing clomiphene or enclomiphene? Clomiphene. Okay, look, we're not doctors, okay, but what you can do when you yeah. get off here is look up clomiphene versus enclomiphene. Enclomiphene is E N and then the same word. Um, and I would also look up HCG. Like, from my understanding, the, the, the best fertility protocol, especially for sperm count for a man, is enclomiphene plus HCG. I mean, I know guys on testosterone, taking testosterone. Now, I was one of them. I was on testosterone, but because I, I use HCG, also, I got my wife pregnant on accident. So I would look up <laughs> enclomiphene versus clomiphene and then look at HCG. Yes. Like, that's the that's the protocol, uh, the the current, like, number, like protocol that I'm hearing, that are reading about to be the best for fertility. But as far as workouts are concerned, less is better. Mm -hmm. Just get stronger. Eat whole natural foods. Don't avoid food. Eat when you're hungry. 
hit your protein targets. That's the recipe. And then get good sleep, get sunlight. But you're already a construction worker, Upgrade so you have plenty of sunlight. Pit vipers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I definitely hit my protein. Um, I, I average about you know 190 grams a day. Good. Um, I eat a lot of chicken breast and uh, ground beef. So. Okay, good. And yeah. then your sleep is good? Uh, yeah, I usually get, I average about seven and a half to eight hours. Okay. Yeah, that's good. It's your workout. I think you were overtraining. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you have MAPS anabolic? No, I don't. I was, uh, I guess originally my, my plan wasn't to go full fitness. It was just casual gym to get my blood flow in and help out. Uh, so I was just following, uh, I have an app that I, I was just giving me a workout just to keep me on routine. No, I'm going to send you MAPS Anabolic. Yeah. Follow MAPS Good Anabolic. Good program is what yeah. you need. You'll get stronger on that for yeah. sure. Two days a week. The two-day-a-week option. Just start there. That's it. That's plenty. Don't try and do anything So, so definitely cut off Definitely cut off my third day because I average between two to three is what I always shot no, for. Two's yeah. fine. Yeah. With yeah. what, you're, with yeah, what yeah. you're dealing with, do two. Yeah, totally. All right. All well, right, man. Good luck. God bless. Hey, if, if, if you guys get pregnant, let us know. That's exciting. <laughs> I think you will. Oh, we're trying. The best part is two trying, years now, right? so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah, we, yeah. we. I think you'll get there, bro. But just yeah. And then look up those things that I said, and bring them up to your doctor. And and if you if you want a second opinion, uh, we have partners at mphormones.com that are like cutting edge, um, and see what they say. All right, appreciate it. You got it, man. Thank you. That's an old protocol. I old protocol. Nastrozol. So. Yeah, that's the block to convert. That's I a, know what it's for. I take it. I know exactly what it's so for. So that, that is like, like a general practitioner and not like the a old protocol specialist. for fertility for men. So it's interesting. So clomiphene is clomid. Clomid was a fertility. Uh, it's a it's a serum that was for women, and they, and they would give it to men to raise their testosterone. You could do the same thing with Nolvidex, which was tamoxifen, hmm. but they both have kind of nasty side effects. And clomiphene has less of those side effects and in the data that I've seen raises testosterone more. Um, and then HCG, like that'll make you make sperm. I mean, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I'm curious, this, you know, especially if he's trying to have a kid, right? why they didn't do those, those two things. Maybe because the doctor's like, let's see if this works. I don't mm -hmm. know. Well, HCG is the answer for this. I mean, again, we're not doctors, but I'm telling you right now, like when I was going through all this fertility stuff, I remember after taking just two shots of HCG, literally it got all the nurses and doctors around to talk all about my sperm count. Was, <laughs> I'm serious. It was like- You guys got to see this. Katrina, yeah, Katrina was just like, holy crap, everybody was talking about your sperm count inside, inside the doctor's office. That's kind of, that's like a, is that, it feels good, right? Yeah, that's I know. Perfect. You just yeah. kind of like- Bunch yeah. of nurses talking about- I mean, I wish I could take the credit hey, There's that me. guy with that high sperm count. Yeah, yeah, What's yeah, up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's effective. It's very effective. These so I'm surprised valuable. they don't- they I got my them. wife accidentally pregnant on that while on testosterone yeah, and I wasn't even taking a lot of it's HCG. It's very effective. So I'm surprised they don't have them on that. Hey, real quick, sorry to interrupt you. Look, we have a sale this month on some programs. We have a beginner program, Map Starter. It's 50% off. Then we have a bundle that's different. It's called the Starter Bundle that includes our most popular programs. That's also 50% off. So if you're interested in that, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Our next caller is Natalie from Canada. Hi, Natalie. How can we help you? Hi, guys. So hello, good hello. to see you in person. Thank you. All right. How can we help you? I first wanted to thank you for all you do and also help my chronic uh, lower back pain. Ever since did your anabolic and other programs, I complete. I have no more back pain, lower back pain that all I right. used to have. And I go to a chiropractor. Awesome. On, on awesome. Completely uh, recommended to anyone who has this problem <laughs> like me. I used to have that. Um, so I start uh, from my notes. Uh, so I'm 42 years old, 5'4", and 171 pounds. Some medical background. Uh, I have large fibroids um, outside my uterus and high prolactin. And because my prolactin has, uh, has been high for the last couple of years, my endo doctor prescribed a medication and the side effect of that medication was that I gained 30 pounds in one year. And I was always active. I was playing ba uh, boxing. I always played soccer. So I was always a cardio junkie, if you will. And I was always fit. So I never had any weight gain problem. And uh, 
um, ever since I'm trying to lose that 30 pound weight and the fit body that I used to have. Um, so to do that, to lose that, I started doing uh, the biggest mistake I ever did, 24 intermediate fasting. And I was doing bleach body six days a week, all at the same time that I was doing that. And I lost my sleep and period um, after a couple of months and uh, didn't lose any weight whatsoever, but I think I lost lots of muscle. Um, and then in 2023, I found my pop and started in the anabolic. I got so um, much stronger and then my uh, body composition definitely improved. Um, and then uh, last year, this time, I ran calorie deficit and lost 10 pounds. Um, and based on you guys' um, recommendation to other people, for the first time I did um, reverse dieting for six months uh, back in December of this year, uh, I mean last year, and then um, upped my calorie to 2,700 calories and my maintenance changed to 2,400. Um, and then at this, when I was doing reverse dieting, I changed to performance. And uh, now, like in, since June, I'm try I've tried again after reverse diet, I tried cutting to 1900. Uh, but since ju June 10th until now, I've only lost 1.76 uh, pounds, which is nothing. And I don't see any change in my uh, visible changes to my pant size or body either. My quads are still big and my shoulders don't have definition, even though I have the muscle, but I don't see any definition to see that. And I'm, right now that I'm in calorie deficit, I'm doing performance twice a week. I walk 7,000 steps a day and I play soccer once one hour a week. I appreciate if you let me know what I'm doing wrong or if I'm wrong. I just have to be more patient. I think what's happening, if, if, for, um, how's your health otherwise? How's your energy and sleep and all that? Um, overall, my sleep is perfect. But in the past two or three days, I noticed I don't have uh, appetite when I wake up. Like, so I don't even crave eating my eggs and like any breakfast at all. I don't know if, it's, uh, if I uh, hit plateau or something like that, but I was good. Like I, my sleep is good otherwise and everything else. How's your stress? It's good. I'm on, I'm a teacher, so I'm on my summer break. Okay. Yeah. I so um, what it sounds like is your your metabolism is adapting very quickly to the deficit, I and so ran a reverse diet longer. Yeah. And when I work with people like this, what what we tend to do is I you know because this can happen sometimes and it can feel very frustrating. It's like what is going on? My body doesn't respond. I was eating you know like you said twenty seven hundred calories. You drop down to nineteen. You would expect to see some changes, but your body's adapting very quickly to the reduced calories. What I would what I would do with clients like this, because continue you can continue reverse dieting, but that can be tough too. Twenty seven hundred calories is a lot, uh, and, you know, and, and so you might be like, "Oh my god, I'm full." What I would do with these people is I'd bring them at maintenance, and I wouldn't even worry about their weight, and we would just continue to get them stronger and continue to improve their health, and then slowly over time things start to work. Uh, in our favor, but it's going to take a little bit of time. If you're cutting down to 1900 from 27, not seeing anything move, that probably means we need to stay in that kind of building and rebuilding your health stage longer than uh, than than you've been doing before we try to lose any weight. There is there is another thing too that I'd want to ask uh, and potentially address. Uh, I know you said like you didn't have an appetite this morning, so you weren't you didn't have the energy to probably even eat your eggs. What are how consistent are you with hitting your protein intake? Like hitting the numbers that you should be at every day. Uh, so based on my target weight that you guys recommend and one gram of protein, um, I should be hitting 140. I'm usually full and can't do more more than 110, but I'm very consistent consistent on that. Like 110 minimum. Every day I do that. Okay. That's not bad. It's, yeah, it's not bad. That's not bad. It's I, not bad so long as that's the consistent thing and you don't yeah. hit 70 and 60 some days and then other days you yeah, only hit no. 110. I, I would, I, I think at this point, like if you were my client, what I would, first off, I'd have you work with a functional medicine practitioner if you want, if you haven't already, just to look and run some labs, make sure everything's okay and healthy. And then I would just say, look, here's what we're going to do for a while. We're just going to keep you healthy. We're going to keep you fed. I'm not going to reverse diet you necessarily, but I'm definitely not going to cut you. 
um, and we're just going to try and improve our fitness. Let's just try to improve our strength, our performance, maybe increase our steps a little bit, but not chase weight loss until your body starts to show you that it wants to lose weight. And the way it's going to look is you're going to, you'll eat at maintenance and you'll train and you'll get stronger and you'll feel good. And then you'll start to get leaner on your own. In which case I'm like, okay, things now are starting to move in the right direction, but it might take, it might take a little while. Are you still, by the way, on the medication that you were taking that caused the weight gain in the first place? No, after one year, I begged my doctor to switch it away. And then after she switched it, at least I, when I try to lose weight, I, at least I can try, uh, I can lose weight. So no, thankfully I'm not on that anymore. Okay. Um, but do you suggest to, now that I'm being on performance since March, do you suggest me I switch to programming too or you can. stay on it? Performance is good. Uh, MAPS Anabolic is good. MAPS Strong is good. MAPS Symmetry, those are all good. Did you, did you finish MAPS Performance already? Yes. Oh, yeah. Let's and, uh, because I'm on uh, cuts, I'm doing twice a day, twice a week uh, on the phase four of the performance which is the easier part of it, I guess. Yeah, let's go. Let's switch you to another program. Um, I think you would like Map Symmetry. I think that'd be a good program. Bump your calories up to maintenance, uh, okay. which which prob I would assume... Around 2,400. Yeah, maybe 2,400, 2,300 calories. And then just try to get stronger. And then uh, um, okay. I, w I, would, I think you should work with a functional medicine practitioner just to see if there's any lingering hormonal effects that were uh, caused by the medication you were taking. Based on the uh, blood test that I did, did on um, July, my hormones are um, all balanced, uh, and my doctor said so too. But only the prolactin is high. I don't know how what is that effect on the body, but like my prolactin is still very high. Yeah, have you have you looked at your thyroid antibodies? Because I'm sure you got your TSH. Yeah, that is. That is normal. Okay, yeah. so no, okay, no gut health issues I either. Say gut is what mm -hmm. I would mean. Okay. I mean, uh, functional medicine practitioners can tend, can sometimes find things that traditional doctors don't, but right. I, I'm not necessarily saying there's something wrong. I've worked with people like you yeah. and it's just, yeah. we just had to yeah. stay on yes. getting more fit and strong and not worrying about the scale. And then what usually happens, what actually every time happened yeah. was at some point their body just started to switch on. And then we're like, okay, the signs are good. Now let's see if we can cut. And then it worked. I mean, I had one lady I trained for a year and a half like that before we ever even tried to lose any weight. And it took that long before her body really started moving in the right direction. I see. And then do you do you think by doing that, my body composition will improve? Yep. yep. Like, I don't care yes. as much about the weight now as long as my yes. Yes. body fits yes. again. And Slowly but surely. And you should, you should actually see that sooner than later, right? I think that's one of the positive things about a situation like this. I also have experienced this with clients where their body just adapts really quick. It, to it really, cut, right? to me, the way I'd explain to my clients, like your body is just telling us it needs and wants more calories. It needs and wants more calories for what we're trying to do to it. So let's give it instead of depriving it all the time, let's give it what it needs. And then if we do a good job, it should slowly build muscle, which in turn will speed up the metabolism, which in turn will slowly lean you out. And so it's a very, slow process in regards to the scale but as we would test like circumference or body fat percentage once a month we would see this progress and so i'd always reminder like hey this is this is great We're news the right yeah i know the scale isn't swinging hard but i'm seeing inches come off your waist i'm seeing you actually moving in the right direction with lean body mass we're doing great mm -hmm. your body is responding well so um, that that's something that I would pay attention to. You maybe just do a circumference on your waist, or maybe see if you can get some body fat testing once a month, just so you know that you're probably on the right. I, so I, yeah, and I mean, I could come up with a, uh, like a few theories as to why this happens to some people. In my experience, it was people that did really aggressive dieting in the past, um, and so they're for whatever reason they, their bodies just adapted to reduction in calories very rapidly. But I don't know. I don't know necessarily why this happens to some people. I think it has something to do with that. Maybe when you were doing that those long fasts, um, you know, maybe that in combination with the the medication you're on. But in all cases, it was like, okay, like our body is saying, your body is saying, it's not going to respond. So let's just improve your health. Let's just get you healthy. Let's just keep working on your fitness. Let's keep getting you stronger. Let's change our focus to like, can we get you stronger on certain lifts? get you feeling good. And then like clockwork, uh, the bo their body would start to show signs that it was ready to go. But it would just take a little while. Okay, sure. 
and uh, thank you so much. And then one last question. Um, I haven't been able to, in terms of strength wise, I haven't been able to um, uh, lift a heavier weight more than uh, 40 pounds that I'm uh, lifting right now. Should I try to lift just a bit heavier? If it's you, been couple. Of, it's been like a eight months that I haven't oh, been yeah, able. To. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This will are be, you are you afraid of going heavier? or Does it feel like you can't? I feel like I can't, especially when the reps are higher. Like for example, performance compared yeah. to anabolic was much more okay. reps, right? Uh, you know. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to give I'm going to give you a tip that I, that should really help you right here. Okay, so you're in our programs, you know there's going to be like certain phases where it calls for 10 reps or 15 reps or things like that. When I have someone like you, I actually care less about you hitting the target 10 reps mm -hmm. as much as I care about adding more weight. So I would prefer you choose a weight that's so heavy that you have to stop at eight reps because it's so heavy than to pick a weight that you could easily do 10 or you know for sure you could get 10. And I don't care if you don't get 10. It's okay we didn't get 10 because I really want you to push push the weight. I think your body, especially if we're feeding it now, we're giving it, it, it maintenance calories mm -hmm. and we're pushing that strength I think that you're going to see your body respond a lot. If you have, if you've also kind of leveled out on this on your uh, weight, and we're not really progressive overloading the body anymore, it is also probably adapted to that, and so that's part of why it's not, it's probably, not changing. Probably a reason why you're not, you know, hungry in the morning. Too. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, that that, that will help. Literally, your goal. It, you remember that as you're getting under that bar, you're about to lift it. You know, Adam says it doesn't matter if I don't hit 10, but I want to lift more weight today. So I'm going to put as much as I can on it. If I only get six or eight, no big deal. That's not a big deal. I don't care. I care more that you've added five or 10 pounds to that bar that you've never done before. That's going to serve us. Got it. Thank you so much, Adam. Yes. I appreciate it. You got it. You got Thanks. it. And by the way, if you follow map symmetry and you're not getting stronger consistently, I suggest you go to maps, um, uh, maps 15. Okay. So you, okay. If, if you're not getting stronger within the first couple weeks, then let's go to maps 15 and do that. Okay. Cause if you're not getting okay. stronger, then something's not right. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Guys. You got it. Natalie, Thank right. you. Have a good time. Take care. I've had, th those are the most, I had one. I mean, I, like I was just talking about her. It was frustrating. It was difficult. I, oh, bro, we would reverse diet her, cut I'm her calories. I'm so glad, though, she so shared long. what she shared right there at the end because that will also contribute to this. Yeah, eight yeah. months, yeah. eight Not months the same the weight. of lifting the exact yeah, same no. weight. Her body is so adapted to that that yeah. just and then cutting the calories is not it's not no, you're not progressively not at all. and and literally this is what I would do with someone like that like she'd be like all right we get ten reps oh I don't know if I can do that. that's all right I don't care we stop at five or six I don't care no. let's put a weight on that bar you've never done before and let's get after her. hope we hit that ten and if you have yep. to stop the at six yeah we the stop at six is challenging yourself with that's more right. increased load that's right and that alone I think will will do you and know and by more. the way it can't be overstated because I've worked with female clients were simply getting challenged by me as their trainer, got them stronger. Mm -hmm. yep. This is where it, the, the tremendous value, if she hears this, uh, you know, you want to talk about things that I would consider investing in. This is where having a coach or a trainer, who's oh, yeah. there, that way you feel safe and yeah. you got a spotter yep. Yep. and you got them there to, to push you because that extra push is really going to help her get over this plateau. Our next caller is Mackenzie from New York. Mackenzie, what's happening? Hello. Hi there. How are you all? Good. Good. How are you? Great. Good. I just want to thank you all so much. I am a triathlon and um, nutrition coach. And so everything I basically send in my newsletters each week is from your all's information from the podcast. So you all make my job awesome. a lot easier. So uh, I you. love hearing when coaches and trainers use that. It, I think it's hilarious when they don't. I'm like, I would totally use all of our stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I rip awesome. it all off. So. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. All right. So I'll, I'll jump into it. So as a nutrition coach, and this is going to be a little bit more geared towards nutrition coaching. Um, I've got a few ladies who are in their 60 plus range and I'm working with them on their nutrition programming, but I've had a hard time getting the scale to move for them without cutting their calories so drastically low. So a lot of them, I mean, my mom is in this group as well. That group is like, well, you just don't eat if you want to lose weight. And I feel like that's been their mentality for years and years. And so I'm trying to get them to do resistance training, um, get them on a really good macro protein goal, setting that really high. But we're just, ha I'm having a hard time with some of these ladies actually getting the scale to budge. 
And I didn't know if you guys had any insights or help in this. Um, I think it's been about like 12 weeks or so that I'm working with them and they want immediate results, which I completely understand, but I feel like sometimes it may take a little bit longer. So just wanted to see if you guys had any help or insights in this case. Are these triathletes? Are they, are they running by? They, these are actually not triathletes. So these okay. are just women who found me um, through nutrition programming. Well, okay. first of all, you got to get, you got to get the enemy out of this, this picture, which is the scale. Yeah, uh, Cause sure, you're going to be fighting the scale this whole time. It's going to make, it's going to tell them, yeah. it's going to tell them the opposite of what you're saying. So you're, you're going to say to them, out. we got to build muscle. We got to speed up your metabolism. We need to feed you, you know, properly. And then they're going to weigh themselves every day and say, it's not going down. You're lying. And you're going to be fighting with them constantly. So what I would do is say, uh, and I would communicate that like, and I used to say funny things to people. Like I'd say, you know, let's cut your leg off. We lost 20 pounds. They'd, they'd laugh and I'd say, well, <laughs> yeah. it's not measuring anything but body mass. So I would switch it to body fat testing and I would do a body okay. fat test, you know, with, with caliper. Do you see them in person? I don't see some of them I do, but some of them I don't. So it's a good mix. So you can use circumference yep. or you can Waste do uh, uh, calipers, but test body fat percentage because, uh, and you know, That's you can great. explain to this, you can explain this to them and you say, look, if you lost 10 pounds of body fat and replace it with 10 pounds of muscle, you'd be smaller because muscle is more dense, but you'd also have a faster metabolism and you'd look a lot better because muscle shapes the body. Fat just kind of sits uh, everywhere. Um, but, but the body fat test tells you a lot because two in every two weeks you could test their body fat and go, wow, you went down, That's great. you went down a half percent. And then I would do the numbers and I'd show them you lost this much body fat, even though your weight is the same. Oh my God. That's great. You know, type of deal. So I would get rid of the, get rid of the scale is a big one. Oh, oh, okay. So a lot, this is something that we talk in our coaching program about, because to me, this is like the real stuff that coaches and trainers get challenged with that national certs don't tell you like, okay, how do you deal with a situation like this? And a big way to handle this McKenzie is actually being able to forecast this before people like it's, I always had a hard time as a coach and a trainer, like when this came up and it would happen. And then it's like, you know, they're already frustrated because they're not seeing the scale go down. They're doing all this work. And then I'm trying to explain it versus when I start them day one on the program and I tell them what we're going to do. And then I tell them what's going to happen in a couple weeks down the road is you're going to come to me and you're going to want me to do this. And you're going to want me to do that because you're not going to see a lot of movement on the scale. That's what I want. I'm, I'm trying to build your metabolism right now. We are building muscle. We're building strength. Now that is going to change your body. Your waist is going to come in. Your muscles are going to tighten up. You're going to feel better. But what can be discouraging for my clients is when they look at the scale and they're expecting it to go down because they, that's what they're watching. And so I'm letting you know that this is coming ahead of us. And so it makes this time where now yeah. where you're when you're in it so much easier to kind of overcome it versus you know, getting somebody started on a program and then they're going along and then the weeks go by and then they're in this boat and then you're like trying to explain what's going on and then they're already frustrated and discouraged. It makes a world of a difference telling them what they're going to tell you before they tell them. And you know that. You just know that this is coming with this type of a client. I can tell you're experienced enough to have seen this before. So remembering that, you know what, I got to get better at when I first meet with these people telling them that they're, even if they're not going to, because maybe you get lucky and they just trust you, but there's always that percentage that are going to be like this. And so letting them know that, so you can just remind them, well, remember what I told you when we first started that you were going to feel this way and that's very normal. Like I always let them know right. too, that this is normal. Everybody feels this way, but this is part of the process. And we got, and this is where the mo and this is what I'll tell them. This is where most people make their mistake. They see the scale, they get discouraged. They start cutting more calories. They start running, thinking just so they can see a couple pounds going on the scale and they end up only shooting themselves in the foot. So I'm, and that's why you hired me is I'm here to coach you through that process and not allow you to go back. Like so many people do. This is all part of the process. Yeah. I love that. I used to use visuals too. I, I, I had a, I had a couple of visuals where I had a, a hundred and it was a 140 pound woman at 30% body fat. Uh, I don't remember the height was, but it was same height, same body weight, 20% body fat. So I'd show them these two pictures and I'd say, do you, you, you know, believe it or not, they weigh the same. Or I'd show a man, you know, 200 pounds, 20% body fat, 10%. They weigh the same because it's not the scale that really matters to them. It's how they look. It's really how they look and how they feel. Like, do you care what your weight is if you look and feel the way you want to? And it's really important to explain body composition 
versus weight on the scale. It's very important and how metabolically active muscle is and how it's going to do the work for them. I, you know, people, th these are all things that tend to re that we found resonated with our clients. Like, do you want your body to burn more calories on its own? Or do you want to have to get up and move every time you want to burn more calories? You know, that's another selling point. But that communication plus forecasting tends to set you up pretty well. I, I mean, I feel that you have to do that first because mm -hmm. even if you have all the great science, all the great information. No, no, no. If it comes up and then what, you try to you yeah, try to defend, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it doesn't work as holes. well. That, that's, what, that's what makes this so difficult. because And why that is is because when they invested in you, when they bought that training, they had a picture of how this was going to go. You probably, as a coach, knew already how it would go, but maybe we didn't communicate that thoroughly enough to that person. And if you do communicate that, and you you basically, I mean, you overcome those objections before they even come up. That way, when this does come up in six weeks, because it still will, you can remind them, like, you know, this is what I was telling you that, and this is that, this is that moment where you feel like you want to quit or you want to do this, and I need you to trust me that I've been doing this a long time and I know what I'm doing, that this is that we got to stay the course. And in fact, if I, it sounds like we need to throw away the scale because this is what I was concerned about was if you're weighing and checking on yourself, you're letting that get in your head, and I'm telling you we're doing a great job and stay the course. M Mackenzie, are they doing strength training now or is this something you're going to introduce? I'm trying to introduce it when they come on board with me is – it is imperative that we're strength training and doing, I actually downloaded muscle mommy and I provide that to my mom so she can really see what that looks like in terms of strength awesome. training, but really educating them on that too. Awesome. And then remember the, the way that you speak, the, the confidence that they hear in your voice makes a tremendous difference uh, in initial stages of them trusting you. It really does. Um, so you want to speak with authority in ultimate confidence. Like, th no, this this is how it works. This is what it is. Here's how you're going to feel. Everybody does this. Everybody screws up. This is why everybody fails. This is why I'm so successful. This is why I know what I'm doing. But if you want the data, I'll share that with you. But I'm telling you, this is how it works. Like, you want to be very confident in those initial stages because if they hear a little break in your in your confidence, they're going to jump all over it. And, and the, the, the second right. it doesn't go in the direction they want it to go. Yeah, it doesn't help too. A lot of them, they will be couples and the guys, well, the men will also start with me. And then of course they lose weight in 10 days. And then the women are like, what the heck am I doing wrong? And I'm trying to provide the same program, but you know, it sounds like reframing yeah. is going to be the key. Yes. Yeah. And remember yes. this, men generally carry more muscle mass. So if, when you change a diet, oftentimes what you'll initially see is water loss. Men have more water to lose from their muscle. So if you did two low carb diets, guys will lose eight, eight pounds right off the yeah. gates. The woman might lose four <laughs> or three. Right. Perfect. I appreciate that so much. Um, and I just had another question. I know you all mentioned this a lot, but we have the perfect plans, right? We give everyone, I have the perfect triathlon plan, the perfect nutrition plan. And I'm like, if you just followed it, it would be perfect. <laughs> like you would lose the weight or get where you need to go in terms of yeah. um, training. But I was just curious if you guys had any like, actionable things that you have told your clients. And I think this probably goes back to the confidence and reframing everything, but just trying to get them to stay on the plan and really understand it and trust it. Um, well, as I, I'm providing I, it. I can't stress. I know it's, I'm going to sound like a broken record saying this, but this, this literally was like, uh, I remember this in my career of like reaching and there was like levels of like, when I thought I was like, at first I thought I was terrible as a trainer then I thought it was okay. And then there became a level where I was like, like, okay, I'm, I'm really good at what I do. And when I became really good as I had trained enough people, when a, a person is enrolled with me, I, and I knew based off their goal, based off the, the little bit of time I'd spent with them, I had a good idea of like what our challenges were going to be. And if I could t cut that off on day one and tell them like, the, and, and you don't have to say them, right? You say like, I've had a lot of clients uh, in a very similar situation and here's the things that we're going to go through and we're going to be challenged with. And and I forecast that it mm -hmm. just, it, it, really, it really does solve a lot of this because when those feelings and those emotions and they get, and they don't want to adhere to it, they don't fall, like you've already told them that's what's going to happen. You're, you're going to struggle with wanting to do this. You're going to struggle with wanting to do that. This is why so many people fail at it. This is why you've hired me and you got me. So I want you to know when those times and those moments come, I'm going to remind you, hey, this is one of those times right now where most people, they, they, they're consistent for a couple of weeks and they fall off and that that's the difference maker right there. Like this is where we got to... And so... The better you get 
at at forecasting all that at the very beginning, it really solves so many of the like at, the stuff with adherence. It really solves re-signing the client. It really solves the getting caught up in the scale because you do a and you'll just get better at better at remembering to say all of it at the very beginning. And I and I promise you that it will solve a lot of these issues. It does, and and also McKenzie, um, when you're giving somebody the you know the quote unquote perfect program, just follow. Well, first off, <laughs> if if that were the solution, then they wouldn't need you, or they wouldn't, and we wouldn't exist. You would just True. you would go on Google, yeah. you get the workout, the diet, you know, you would mm -hmm. input the data, and then you would just follow it. Uh, that's not how it works. You have to set them up for success. Don't sem set them up for failure. One of the the number one guaranteed ways to set someone up to failure. When they're to, for failure, to, when they first get started, is by giving them everything all at once, because uh -huh. nobody yeah. makes those radical changes <laughs> right out the gate. Yeah. It just doesn't work that way. So, to give you an example, early in my career, when a client came in to try to hire me, I would convince them to come to the gym as much as possible. Later in my career, when I got good, when people came in to get excited, I would convince them to come to the gym little, less. They'd come to be like, "Look, I want to work out four days a week." No, 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 we're going to do two days a week. But why not? Is it more better? No, no, let's start too. So you have to set them up for success. So as a coach, you got to meet them where they're at. Don't take them here and move them way the hell over here, even though it's the perfect program, because it's not perfect because they're not going to follow it or they might, and then they'll stop. Right. Yeah. So you got to meet them where they're at. You have to set them up for wins. Don't set them up for and fails. And when you do that, you explain why. It's like, I listen, I know you're motivated. I know you want to do four days a week, but this is why we're only going to do two. Okay. And don't worry, the entire time you're going to see results. That's right. You got to make sure you assure them of that because they'll be good. like, oh, yeah. yeah, 100%. Awesome. McKenzie, we Thank you all so much. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. You got are, it. Are you following the, the Instagram page that we started for trainers? Are you on that yet? The Mind Pump Trainers? I'm on, not the, no, I don't think so. I'll follow that though. Yeah, yeah. Well. On Instagram, we have it's a, free. Mind, it's free. We put free, co great content up every single day. Stuff Amazing. like, stuff just like this, right? So it's mostly yeah. geared just towards trainers, towards both how, the business how, side and coaching. How part. long have you been coaching people, by the way? I've been coaching triathlon for about two and a half years and then just started nutrition coaching oh. about six months ago. So it's like. McKenzie. near and dear to my heart and I want to help everyone. Listen, so I'm trying to get this nailed down. What I said is the most important then because working with triathletes is not the same thing as working with the average person. No. When you're working with it, when you're working with an athlete, especially a triathlete, okay, you just tell them what to do and they do it. Yeah, they're disciplined. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's easy. Yes. That it's is not so how easy. the yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. oh, this is easy. That is not how the average person works. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not it's not about giving them the answers to the test. Not at all. You yeah. can just you got to move them there slowly. So now it's making perfect sense. Yeah. You got to meet them where they're at. Don't don't give them the perfect routine. It doesn't exist. You got to slowly walk them there. Yeah. And then they'll let you know when they're ready. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's very good. Right. Thank you all again. I appreciate it. You all got right, it. Kenzie. I'm glad I asked that last part. Yeah. Training athletes. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. Way now. different. Yeah. No, no. Here's complete. your diet. Here's your workout. Well, okay, sir. You, yeah. All right, coach. I got it. I mean, this is a- uh, Average person? Nope. Yeah. It, it was like so eye-opening just to see dysfunction everywhere in their movement, you know? And I was just like, why? I, I perform something. You can't do this. Like, it's, What do I do now? Yeah. What do I do now? <laughs> and so she's going to go through a lot of that. Like the, just the capabilities- and the needs are completely different and you just have to really just, you know, regress way back and, and find out what's the right dose. I mean, a bit of a shameless plug, but this is why we created the coaching program was because national certifications that were out there don't address these types of conversations. No. Yep. They it, teach you how to do the, crucial. They teach you how to do the X's and O's. This is how right. you program. This is how the, you do macros. That's like, not what makes you successful. The problem is ain't nobody yeah. like that. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and that, and eventually still have to sell it still have to keep them coming back. That's right. Eventually you have to learn how to have this. And I, I really believe there's an art to this. I really believe there's an art to being able to sit down for a half hour, hour, talk to somebody and then get a very good idea idea of, okay, I know the person's goals. I know what's going to be challenging for them. And then knowing how to communicate that back to them right from the jump. And when you get good at that, then when all of these normal challenges that every trainer has with their coach or with their clients happens, you actually look brilliant because you told them how they were going to feel before they felt that way. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, it just they builds trust, trust. Yep. that builds trust in you. Like, Oh shit. He, he not only, he knows me so well, he knew how I'd feel before I felt it. Damn. Like, okay, I, I trust where this guy's leading me. Cause now. then he also said, this is going to happen. That's right. And so you, that this is so powerful versus 
waiting until that moment happens and then trying to like show them the studies and the science and overcome it. It's like, like you're just defending. Yeah, it. Then, then, then that's so much that's so much more difficult than if I cut it off at the at the beginning. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out.